and uh, excellent feedbacks from the candidates. So I hope today also you will enjoy the course. Uh, today's session will be moderated by Dr. Sol Masberi, who was introduced yesterday by Dr. Titia. She is a fetal medicine expert from Iran, and she is the ambassador of the International Society of Ultrasound of ob to the Middle East and North Africa. So the floor is yours, Dr. Solma, and you can start uh, today's session. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Musa, for the kind introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to start the uh, second day of basic training course in Oman. And I would like to ask uh, Professor Suresh to start his talk about distinguishing normal and abnormal skull and brain. And as he has been introduced uh, by Dr. Titia yesterday, I just skipped the introduction. And uh, so I ask uh, Professor Suresh to start his talk. So over to you, Professor. Good evening. Uh, are you able to see my screen? Yes, yes, it is clear, Doctor. Okay, thank you. Good evening and welcome uh, to the second day of the ISWOG basic training course. Today, I'm going to tell you something about uh, distinguishing between normal and abnormal appearances of the skull and brain. So at the end of this lecture, you'll be able to describe how to apply, obtain the three planes required to assess, including measurement of the fetal head correctly. They recognize the differences between the normal and the most common abnorm abnormal ultrasound appearances of the three planes of the fetal brain. So we all know about the 20 plus two planes which we discussed yesterday. And in that, the head planes are planes four, five, and six. Now, what are the requirements from planes four, five, six, which are the head planes? Plane four is the transventricular plane where we look for skull shape, skull size, integrity, and bone density look for cavum septum pellucidum, the frontal and anterior horns of broad lateral ventricles, the posterior horn of the lower lateral ventricle. I specifically say lower lateral ventricle because I will explain that as we go by. Now, once the la lateral ventricle measurement is more than 10 millimeters, it's a criteria for referral. And the abnormalities that can be seen here are anencephaly, lemon-shaped skull, in open spina bifida, ventricomegaly, and a lobar holoprosencephaly. In the transthalamic pain, we look for frontal horns of both lateral ventricles, the cavum septum pellucidum, thalami, hippocampal gyrosis. Then here it is in this measure plane, we measure BPD, head circumference, and we if it's outside of the normal range of the, uh, of the size chart, then we refer. I'd like to say that the transthalamic plane or the transventricular plane can be used for measurement of the BPD. The transcerebellar plane, we look at frontal horns of both lateral ventricles, the CSP, this is extremely important. Uh, look at thalami, the cerebellum, and the cisterna magna. And if it is more than 10 millimeters, then we know that it is outside the normal range. We measure the transcerebellar diameter, and we look at the shape of the cerebellum here banana or absent cerebellum in open spina bifida, large cyst in the posterior fossa, occipital encephalocele, cystic hygroma, and skin edema are the ones which we can rule out in these planes. Now let's see how to move this, through these three planes. We are going to start with the trans planes four, five, six, which is the transventricular plane. We mentioned yesterday that we look at the sagittal view of the spine, from plane one or two, then you rotate through 90 degrees and you go up till you see uh, the, uh, the ventricular plane. Then you move down to the transthalamic plane and then rotate slightly to get the transcerebellar plane. So what we do is to identify the junction of the cervical spine and occiput in the sagittal plane. At this point of time, you rotate your probe 90 degrees and you identify the cranial vault. You gently angulate the probe so that you get a, uh, the skull comes horizontally on the screen. And then you go to the transventricular plane. 
that's your transventricular plane here with the lateral ventricle, the cavum septum pedalstum, and the benign fox. Then you move down a little bit to get, see the transthalamic plane. And then you gently tilt down to see the transcerebellar plane. Now, just to show you how the probe is moved, you go up from the spine, you do a lateral view, and then move uh, as per what has been described. So that's, that's the thalamic plane. And you can see the lateral ventricular plane and the transcerebellar plane. So this is very critical. I mentioned it twice because uh, gentle movements of the probe are required to get these plates. Now let's talk about the transventricular plate. We know it is the most scaffolded of the three planes, the highest point in the skull. Then we look for integrity or intactness of the skull. A quick look around to know that the skull is completely intact in all the places. The next, of course, is the bone density. You should see a bright skull and the bone density is assessed by the fact that the uh, far hemisphere, you can see the midline fox here, the far hemisphere is seen well, whereas the structures in the near hemisphere should not be seen well. There should be poor visualization here. That means there are reverberation artifacts from the skull and that's why you're not able to see it. And that's a good sign because it tells you the skull is well mineralized or ossified. The third thing we want to look at is the midline fox, not the white line which runs, and is interrupted by the cavum septum pellucidum. And then we see the occipital or posterior horn of the lower lateral ventricle. And here uh, is the point where we actually do the measurement. Now, at the same time, you will be able to see a small little uh, slit-like structure which is the frontal horns of both lateral ventricles. And inside the lateral ventricle, you can see the choroid plexus. Now, the atria of the lateral ventricle is what needs to be measured. And the measurement technique is as follows. You have a symmetrical axial view. You optimally zoom the image so that the skull occupies almost three fourths of the screen. The atrium is measured at the level of the glomus of the choroid plexus. This is the area of the glomus of the choroid plexus, and uh, it is just opposite the parieto occipital sulcus. You can see the parieto occipital sulcus there, and just opposite that, you place your caliper. The caliper should touch the inner to inner, inner ventricular wall to inner ventricular wall, and it is perpendicular to the long axis of the ventricle. It's not perpendicular to the skull, but it is perpendicular to the long axis of the ventricle. So the two equal hemispheres must be uh, is very important because if you take an oblique measurement, the measurements are likely to be wrong. Now here I, I have shown you, this is the correct measurement of the lateral ventricle. Here the uh, calipers are placed perpendicular to the floor or the couch. And here we have taken it from the midline uh, uh, it, and it's completely wrong because the, the, the occipital horn is not well defined. So the normal ventricle is less than 10 millimeters in uh, measurement. And if it is more than 10 millimeters, the patient should be referred for further opinion. Now let's go to the transthalamic plane. The anatomical landmarks we want to see in the transthalamic plane. One is the midline fox. And the midline fox here also is interrupted by the cavum septum pellucidum. And then you see the two thalami as two hypoechoic areas and it is separated by the fox and uh, the hippocampal gyri immediately after that. And then you also see the lateral sulcus, which you see uh, if you go straight down from the cavum septum pellucidum, that's where you'll see the lateral sulcus. The lateral sulcus in the second trimester is wide open and in the third trimester, it will become narrower. Now, looking at cranial biometry, uh, the BPD and HC, I said either the transventricular plane or the transthalamic plane can be used. We need to use the appropriate charts. The angle of insonation should be 90 degrees to the midline echoes. So this is the midline echo of the fox. The angle of insonation should be 90 degrees to that so that 
you get the best uh, uh, view of the midline fox and you can see the symmetrical lateral ventricles uh, and the uh, symmetrical hemispheres, which um, is the point where you measure. Now the cerebellum should not be visualized. You measure uh, BPD outer to inner, and if you want to use the uh, heads, the occipital frontal diameter is taken from outer to outer, and then uh, the head circumference can be used. You can use an ellipse to get, go through the head circumference, and that's outer, the outermost circumference that is taken. The cephalic index is calculated from the bipedal diameter and the occipital frontal diameter. It is BPD by OFD into 100. And the normal is 75 to 85. If, the, if it is less than 75, it is called dolicocephaly, where the occipital frontal diameter will be quite large and the BPD will be smaller. And if, it is, if the BPD is larger than the OFD, then it is called brachycephaly. Now, we use standard reference chart and the 5th centile and the 95th centile are taken as the two boundaries and any values above the 95th centile or the fifth, below the 5th centile, the patient must be referred for a second opinion. Now, let's look at cerebellar diameter. When you look at the posterior fossa, it's important that you ensure complete visualization of the cerebellum. As you can see in this picture, the cerebellum is completely visualized. If you angle it too steeply, then you will go inferiorly and uh, the, the cisterna magna space will become larger and that will not be an appropriate measurement. Complete visualization, symmetrical dumbbell-shaped uh, cerebellar hemispheres and uh, you measure outer to outer. So that's the transcerebellar plane where you get the frontal horns of the lateral ventricle must be seen and the cerebellum must be seen at the same time. The cavum septum velocidum must be seen along with the cerebellum. The thalami is also seen at that point and the cerebellar hemispheres and the cisterna magna will be visualized. So the transcerebellar diameter is the maximum diameter in the correct plane. The cisterna magna goes from the outer edge of the vermis the center portion is called the vermis from the outer edge to the inner edge of the occipital bone. The normal range is between 2 to 10 millimeters. Now, if this transcerebellar diameter is less than the fifth centile for the period of gestation, the patient needs to be referred. If cisterna magna is greater than 10 millimeters or if the cerebellar hemispheres appear separated, then this patient must be referred for the next opinion. Now, what are the common abnormalities that can be excluded from plane 4, 5, and 6? First is, let's look at the cranial vault. Here you can see an absent cranial vault, which is a very classical picture of anencephaly. And this, of course, must be diagnosed with absolute certainty in all patients. The second is the shape of the skull. So here, you can, normally the skull is oval-shaped. Here you can see a lemon-shaped skull, and this lemon-shaped skull being the two frontal bones are scalloped, and that's because there's been a herniation of the hindbrain, and that which happens in spina bifida, and because of that, the, there's a pushing back of the brain, colic, causing scalloping of the skull bones, and a very typical lemon-shaped skull appears. And that immediately will prompt you to go and look at the spine, and then you can identify the spina bifida. The other head shapes are dolicocephaly and brachycephaly, where the BPD is larger. Then you have a flat uh, occipital region, which gives the shape of the skull like a strawberry-shaped skull. And this is typically seen in trisomy 18. Then you also have a clover leaf skull. This happens because of craniosynostosis, where there's a fusion of the sutures of the skull. And as the skull grows in size, the, it takes the shape of a clover leaf. The next one is to look at bone density. And here you can see that uh, in osteogenesis imperfecta, for example, <coughs> there is a reduced bone intensity 
have a reduced bone density. And because of that, there is good penetration of the sound waves. And that is the reason why the near ventricle is also seen very well. Not only the near ventricle, but the near structures in the brain are all seen very well. And that's a cause for worry and concern. So in the normal skull, there will be poor near field visibility. <coughs> now, the next is we need to look at the integrity of the skin, cranial vault. So as you keep eyeballing, as you go around the skull, you reach a point where there's a disruption of the skull. And at the point of disruption, you see something protruding out. And here, this is a clear cystic space. And here there's not only uh, uh, something protruding, but there's also some contents inside. So this is um, uh, an encephalocele, which is um, uh, only the membranes, the meninges has come out, and here the brain matter is also herniated. Now, encephalocele can occur anywhere. Most common is occipital. Uh, it could be a meningocele, as you see here, or meningoencephalocele, as you see here and they can vary in size from small size to very large sizes. Then we go to the transthalamic and ventricular planes, which is basically we'd like to look at ventricular megaly. Now, the atrium of the lateral ventricle is, that should be at 10 millimeters. Here it is 10.7, which is mild ventricular megaly. Here it is 15.7 uh, millimeters, which is severe ventricular megaly. And uh, so here, the shape of the ventricle. Here in this picture, you can see not only a dilated occipital horn, but also a dilated frontal horn. Whereas here, you can see a dilated occipital horn, but the frontal horn appears quite pinched. So this is a teardrop shaped uh, ventricle, which is typical in agenesis of corpus callosum. Now, uh, when you don't see the midline fox, you don't see the midline fox, both ventricles are fused with each other and a single ventricle is what is seen. So you can see there's a single ventricle here. There are three, this is holoprosencephaly and there are three types, A lobar, low bar and semi low bar. Out of which the A low bar type is what is being shown here and it is the most severe type. Associated midline abnormalities are present and also association is trisomy 13. If we pay, you need to refer the patient if midline fox is not visualized and the ventricles are fused. Now, what about the transcerebellar plane? The, the most common abnormality you'll see in the transcerebellar plane is the altered shape of the cerebellum. We said there is a cerebellum must be dumbbell shaped. And here you can see the cerebellum is a banana shaped, a banana shaped cerebellum and an obliterated cisterna magna gives you the diagnosis of an open spina bifida. Whereas here, there is an enlarged cisterna magna, which is more than 10 millimeters. The cerebellar hemispheres are intact and the vermis of the cerebellum is also seen, but the cisterna magna is dilated. Right. Now, here you can see the two cerebellar hemispheres, which are not only small in size, but they are separated from each other. The two cerebellar hemispheres are separated from each other. The vermis is completely absent, as you can see in the autopsy picture. And this is very typical of a dandy walker malformation. Now let's move out of the skull. Once you see the, the covering of the skull is the skin. So we pay attention to the skin covering. And then here is a large swelling, which you can see with multiple septations which is not communicating with the intracranial structures. A non-communicating cystic structure with septations behind the head is usually a cystic hygroma. And if there's a skin, which is, uh, you can see a skin edema around the skull, this is usually part of a hydrops. So we look for skin edema in the rest of the rest of the body also. So what are the key features of plane four, five, six? Plane four is transventricular plane. We look at the skull, fox, cavum, septum, pellucidum, and lateral ventricle. We can identify encephaly, encephalocele, 
alobar holoprosen cephali and ventricular megaly plane 5 is the transthalamic plane we do the biometry bpd oft and hc and plane 6 is the transcerebellar plane we do the uh, tcd the cerebellum and the cerebellar vermis we look for any posterior fossa cystic lesions megacystinum magna cystic agroma and also scalp edema so the key points are the head is imaged in three planes transventricular transthalamic and transcerebellar planes it's important to identify the specific landmarks any variation in the appearance should raise suspicion of an anomaly and a lateral ventricle more than 10 mm cystina magna more than 10 mm the patient needs to be referred hc less than 5th centile or greater than 95th centile or when the tcd is less than 5th centile or altered shape of the cerebellum the patient needs to be referred thank you very much for a patient listening Thank you very much, Professor Suresh, for the very nice, clear, and comprehensive talk. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Mega Venkataraman. Uh, she is a senior consultant in fetal medicine in Hula Hospital. After passing, her MD in obstetrics and gynecology from Mumbai University, India, she moved to Oman. She has been working in the Ministry of Health in Oman. During this period, she went to the United Kingdom and worked as a clinical fellow with Dr. Peter Sutil, one of the pioneers of fetal medicine and obtained a diploma in advanced obstetrics, ultrasound and fetal medicine awarded by the RCOG and Royal College of Radiology. She also got her MRCOG during her stay in the United Kingdom. She is a member of the International Society of Ultrasound in Obstetrics and Gynecology in USA, and has been a guest speaker in a number of conferences in Oman, and an instructor and trainer in a number of fetal medicine courses. So Dr. Mega, over to you. That is, thank you, Dr. Solma, for the introduction, and it's a great pleasure to be here today. Parents always get very excited when they are able to see the fetal face. I have them telling me, she looks exactly like my eldest daughter, who's now five years old. A 23 weeker, looking like a five-year-old sister, that's cute. And another mom told me, I'm so happy he has my nose and not my husband's nose. Well, it's always nice to make the parents happy, but you can show them the face that they understand only if you can get the right views. And so I do hope that by the end of this talk, you will be able to understand and to obtain the three planes which are required to assess the fetal face and also recognize the differences between the normal and the most common abnormal ultrasound appearances of the three planes. So what are the key questions that we're going to answer today? What are the ultrasound features of plane 18, 19, and 20? Plane 18 is for the upper lip, 19 is for the orbits, and 20 is for the profile. What are the probe movements that you need to obtain these three planes? And which abnormalities should be excluded after current assessment of planes 18, 19, and 20? So that brings us to the 22 plus two planes. And what we are going to concentrate is the plane 18, 19, and 20. Though these are labeled last, the beginning point of each of them is the transventricular plane, the plane four. And if you want it, you can always look at the face after you've seen the heart. head, which is what I normally do, especially if the face is anterior. If the face is posterior, I will leave it alone and then go back and look at it again at the end of uh, the scan. 
there are a number of facial anomalies that can be picked up on antenatal scan. It's not possible to go through each one of them, but so today I'm going to just cover two of them, the cleft lip, and by that I mean the lateral cleft lip and severe microglossia. So these are the perfect images from the ESOG guidelines. Plane 18 is for the upper lip, the nose, the tip of the nose and the nostrils. Place 20 is the profile showing the forehead, the nasal bone, the tip of the nose, the upper lip, lower lip and the chin. And plane 19 shows the two orbits with the clear lens. Now, as per the ESOC guideline, the minimal evaluation of the fetal face should include visualization of the upper lip, assessment of the upper lip for any possible cleft. And that's the minimum that you should do. If it is technically feasible, then it is always nice to look at the other features like the nose and the nostrils, the orbits and the medium facial profile. So how do we get to these planes? Let's start with plane 18, looking at the upper lip. What are the probe movements we need to do? As I said, we start off with the transventricular plane. And at this point, it is very important to see that your midline is very horizontal. You will then slide your transducer down until you come to the orbits on one end and the cerebellum on the other end. You've already come anteriorly to the orbits, so I will then keep that end of my transducer steady and rotate the end over the cerebellum, away from the cerebellum to get a coronal view of the face. Slide in and out till I get the views that I need. And the rotation will depend upon how flexed or extended is the baby's neck. So that's where we start the transventricular plane. Your midline should be horizontal, the cavum septum and the posterior horn of the lateral ventricle. You then slide over your wide axis downward until you come to the orbit at one end and the cerebellum at the other end. So I will now keep this end of my transducer steady and rotate this end of my transducer away from the cerebellum over the face to get the coronal view of the face. Then slide in and out until you get the upper lip. Uh, this is a slightly open mouth, the lower lip, the tip of the uh, nose and the two nostrils. So the head circumference section with the midline horizontal plane coming down to the orbits and the cerebellum, and then you rotate 45 to 70 degrees until you come to the coronal section of the face, sliding in and out to get the lips and the nasal tip. Now this perfect face develops very early in the embryo. By four to six weeks of uh, embryonic life, the fetal face is developed from two important structures. Uh, that is the pharyngeal arches and the neural crest cells. Cleft lip, and again I'm talking only of the lateral cleft and not the median cleft. So a cleft lip develops when there is uh, incomplete or deficient merging of the maxillary processes and the median frontonasal process, giving you a cleft in the area between the lateral incisors and the canine. While the development of the external face is over by six weeks, the palate develops between the six and eight weeks. And by 12 weeks of embryonic life, it is complete dividing the nasal cavity from the oral cavity. So you may then have a unilateral cleft lip, or you may have a bilateral cleft lip. It may involve the alveolar ridge, or the alveolar ridge may be intact, and it could be associated with 
a cleft palate, the cleft of both the hard and the soft palate. Sorry. Or alternately, you could have just a clefting of the palate and the hard and the soft palate with a very intact alveolar ridge and the lip. Now at this stage, it is very important to understand that when you're screening for a cleft lip, you are only screening for a cleft lip and not for a cleft palate. Okay. Those who are experienced may be able to see the alveolar ridge, but you know, picking up a cleft palate is not impossible, but it is really very difficult. So screening is only screening for a cleft lip and not the palate. And we need to make this clear to the parents. So let's look at some videos. You have the transventricular view, the cavum septum is here, that's the choroid plexus. You're going to slide down towards the eyes and then rotate away from the cerebellum towards the face. So that's the eye. So getting a glimpse of the nose and the lips. Yeah, but you still need to rotate a little more to get a better view of the lips. Yeah, so this is a little better. That's the tip of the nose, the two nostrils, the upper lip, and the lower lip. And when you move in and out, slide in and out, you're able to see what you need a lot better. Fetuses always have this uncanny knack of having either their hand or lower limbs in front of the face. Yeah, so this is another view. In this view, we are seeing the forehead and that's not something we need. We don't need to see the orbits. Yeah, so we need to rotate this section a little more until we can concentrate only on the nose and the lips. Uh, Dr. Mega, your voice is not that clear. Could you please uh, adjust the voice uh, setup? Sorry, I could can't hear you. Can you raise your voice uh, during uh, the presentation? It's not that clear to the family. Uh, okay, sorry. Okay, I'll try talking a little loudly. Yes, now it is much better. Yeah, okay. So as we see, this is a view, the perfect ESOG image that we should aim for. The upper lip, the lower lip, a centrally placed nasal tip with the two nostrils. It's always reassuring to see the nasal tip that is centrally placed, and that's because when you have a unilateral cleft lip, there could be distortion, there is distortion of the nostril on that side and deviation of the nose. This doesn't look like a very adequate section. You can see the nose here, that is the alveolar ridge, yeah, but you're not able to see the nostrils or the lips very clearly. Yeah, and this because you're a little behind in your coronal view, you need to slide forward yeah, to get the nose, the nostrils, and the lip. You can see the upper lip very clearly here. And the ESOC guideline says that this is the minimum that you should get in your mid trimester anomaly scan. You're not able to see the nose in this uh, section. Yeah, but if you angle a little more towards the nose, you would be able to see the nose and the nostrils. This is the lower lip. This is the upper lip with a cleft and a distortion of the nose. Yeah, and that's something that needs a referral. There's a little ambiguity when you refer to cleft lip. You know, some say uh, refer to a cleft lip as only the uh, cleft of the upper lip, whereas the others 
would think that a cleft lip involves clefting of the lip as well as the alveolar ridge. And it is therefore very important that when you write down your notes, you say exactly what you have seen and whether it is just a lip or the alveolar ridge too. The incidence of cleft lip and palate is about one in 7,000 live births in the Europe, which is similar to Down syndrome and talipes there. In Oman, the incidence is very similar for cleft lip and palate. It seems to be around one in 666. However, the incidence for Downs and talipes is higher in Oman. In both cases, it's between around 400 and one in 420. And that's because the incidence of Down syndrome is higher because we do not terminate, we will not terminate a baby with Downs. The incidence of talipes is uh, higher, likely because of the higher in the incidence of consanguinity. So isolated cleft lip without, without involvement of the alveolar ridge is seen in about 25% of the cases. A cleft lip and a palate is seen in 35% of the cases. Most of them are unilateral, about 25%, 10% are bilateral. Whereas an isolated cleft palate would be seen in about 40% of the cases. Let's look at a few images. Yep. This is normal, a centrally placed nasal tip, the nostrils, the upper lip, the mouth, and the lip. This is a bilateral cleft lip, showing the cleft on either side and the prolabium, the tip of the nose here. That's a unilateral cleft lip, the nose, upper lip with a unilateral cleft. That's again a unilateral cleft lip here. And this is a slightly larger unilateral cleft lip, the distorted tip of the nose, the upper lip with the cleft, and in the lower lip. We now come to plane 19 to look at the orbits. And you again start with the transventricular plane. Once you've got the transventricular plane, you slide it down, rotate a little bit until you come to the orbits on one side and the area below the cerebellum on the other side. So it's almost similar to getting the plane 18. When you're trying to get the plane 18, you see the coronal view of the face. You're going to rotate your transducer away from the cerebellum towards the face. For plane 19, you want to see the orbits. You've already got one orbit here. So to the, see the other orbit, you're going to slide your transducer along the narrow axis yeah, towards and dip towards the orbit on the other side. Let's look at the images. So that's where you start the transventricular plane. You slide down until you get the orbit on one side and the cerebellum on the other side. You will then slide your transducer and dipping it towards the other orbit. So what you now get is a fetus in an occipital posterior position, clearly showing the two orbits and the clear lens inside. So again, a midline horizontal section for the head circumference. You slide down to the orbits and the cerebellum and you then dip 90 degrees to make this transverse the fetal head into an occipital posterior section. This is our ESOC perfect picture. The two orbits, the interorbital distance is almost the same as the orbital distance. And you can see the clear lens, the ring-like structures inside. You cannot see the eye lobe, but when you see the lens, you know that the eye is present. That's a coronal view of the fetal face. Yeah, you can see the orbit and the lens on the other upper side. 
yeah but you're not able to see the orbit on the lower side because of the shadowing of the nasal bone again you're seeing the head the forehead area and that's not what we want so you're going to turn this end of your transducer away from the head that you only get the orbits and you get an occipital posterior view like this so this is So this is not good enough because you cannot assess the lower orbit and the lens, whereas this is what you need to aim for. Let's look at some of the images. That's the ease of perfect image of the orbit. That's normal. This is a transverse view of the head, but you can see the two orbits very clearly here. And it is obvious that this orbit, the upper one, is a lot larger than the lower one. So there is obviously something wrong with the orbits. Incidentally, you can also see that the baby has a significant ventriculomegaly. Those are the ventricles and the choroid plexus here. So when you see any anomaly of the fetal face, it is very important to have a good look at the fetal brain because craniofacial anomalies often coexist together. It is also important to do a complete anatomical survey to make sure that there are no other anomalies. Yeah, so there's a discrepancy in the orbits, obviously abnormal, we need to refer for a second opinion. This is not a very satisfactory view. You can only see the upper orbit. You cannot see the lower orbit. You cannot comment on this uh, face. So if you really need to look at the other orbit and you're not able to turn your transducer, I would leave this alone and come back. Ask the mom to go out for a walk and come back so I can have another look at the face. So coming to plane 20, we again start with the transventricular plane. We then slide our transducer down in the wide axis, coming towards the eye, the orbit on one side, and the cerebellum or the area just below the cerebellum on the other side. To see the fetal face in the coronal views, to feed, see the nose and the lips, we had rotated our transducer away from the cerebellum towards the face. To see the orbits, we had slid our transducer along the narrow axis and dipped to see the other orbit to get an occipital posterior uh, position of the fetal head. To get the profile, you have to angle your transducer through 90 degrees, sliding it towards the face at the same time. And you may have to rotate it minimally. So let's see what this minimal rotation means a little later. So you start again with the horizontal transventricular plane. You slide it down as usual to the orbits and the cerebellum. And you then angle your probe through a 90 degrees to get to the profile of the face. Small subtle rotations may be needed to get into the correct plane here. This is a picture perfect ESOG image, the forehead, the nasal bone, the tip of the nose, the lips, and the chin. Yeah. This, in this image, you can see the forehead, the nasal bone. This looks like some loop of the cord, but you're unable to see the nose, the lips, or the chin. And that's because you are slightly parasagital. You must slide minimally towards the center and you would get your perfect image. In this image, again, you're able to get the forehead, you're getting the nasal bone, the tip of the nose, the upper lip, but 
I'm not happy with this area. It could be because there are a lot of cord loops. It could be that the fetus has a genuine problem, but I need to make sure as this end of my fetus is giving me decent views, I will keep this end of my transducer steady and I will just move this end of my, my transducer, rotate it over the chin to see if I can get a more clear image of the chin before I say that this is not normal. So this is an incomplete or an incorrect section. I need to make sure that it is right. This is the most perfect image that you can get. The forehead, the nose, the lips, and the chin. And if you draw an imaginary line between the tip of the nose, the upper lip, lower lip, and the chin, you'll see that they are in a straight line. In cases with micrognathia, the chin would be far behind this imaginary line. Right. So this is perfect. This is good. It's acceptable. Looking at some of the videos. Yeah. yeah. So this is a small image, but you're still getting the proper profile. You know, babies always have this uncanny knack of covering the face either with the legs or the hand. This one here, I, that's the forehead, that's the tip of the nose, but I'm not able to see the nasal bone here. And I'm not getting clear views of the chin. I therefore need to rotate or rearrange both ends of my transducer to see if I can get a better image than this. Yeah, so that's the nasal bone, that's the tip of the nose. So that's the nasal bone, the tip of the nose, the upper lip, lower lip, and the chin. So this is a completely normal uh, face. And if I had relied on the beginning of the slide, I could have made a mistake in my diagnosis. Okay, so let's look at a few of the images. This looks like a completely normal face, yes. So if you're unable to see the mandible in this case, so the severe case of um, micrognathia or absence of the mandible, Definitely abnormal needs to be referred. Again, this looks abnormal. There is severe receding of the chin here. This looks normal. The face, the nasal bone, the tip of the nose, the lips, and the chin. You know, the baby has probably a hand here. I can see the two little bones in the transverse view. I would ask this baby to just remove the hand so that I could get clearer views than a perfect picture. Right, this again is severe micrognathia. This is not a very satisfactory image because again, you're not able to see the chin satisfactorily and I would have another look to see if I can get better images before I call it abnormal. So it could be normal, just that your section is not correct. That's the forehead, the nasal bone, the tip of the nose, upper lip, lower lip, and the chin. And when you have a first look, you would think that this is normal, but a closer look will tell you that this upper lip seems to be protruding out. Yeah? And that's because this baby has a bilateral cleft lip, and this is called premaxillary protrusion or the prolabium, which is typically seen in cases of bilateral cleft lip. So it is extremely important to visualize the upper lip. That is the minimum that is required in the ESOG guideline yeah, because the incidence of uh, cleft lip is about one in 700. Orbital and lens abnormalities are very rare. So though it is always nice to have a look at the orbit, it is not 
a necessity or it's not mandatory in the ISOG guideline. The orbits and the lens can be viewed in the occipital transverse uh, view. The upper lens and the orbit is usually seen very clearly. The lower one can also be seen if you angle or rotate your transducer. Micrognathia, on the other hand, is a very severe abnormality. And before you diagnose micrognathia, it is extremely important to make sure that you're getting a truly mid-sagittal view of the face and not wrongly diagnosing micrognathia because your views are oblique. Of course, if you're not happy with any of the views, it is always important that the patient be referred for a second opinion. You know, always practice to get the perfect ESOG images. You will get there. Thank you so very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Mega, for a very nice, clear, and comprehensive uh, lecture. Uh, the next talk uh, will be by me. Okay, let me just share my screen. Okay, uh, I hope you can see my screen well. So the topic of my talk is assessing the neck and the chest of the baby. The key points uh, that uh, hopefully the objective of this talk that uh, is that hopefully you will be able to recognize the difference between normal uh, and common app the baby in plane six, which is the transcerebellar plane, and recognize the differences between the normal and common abnormal ultrasound appearances uh, of plane. Um, sorry, I, of plane seven, which is the chest excluding the heart. So we will mostly be looking at the lungs. The key questions are, what are the key ultrasound features that describe the normal appearances of the fetal neck? What probe movements should be used to distinguish between true and false positive suspicion of nuchal abnormality? And what are the key ultrasound features that distinguish between normal and abnormal appearances of the fetal lungs? and which abnormalities should be excluded after correct assessment of the neck and chest, excluding the heart. So we will mostly be speaking about plane six and seven, which are the transcerebellar and the lungs. So uh, how to move between the planes, actually I, I will show, show them to you in uh, the next uh, slides, but just going briefly to look through the description of the planes, plane six actually, um, Dr. Suresh made my life much easier. So explaining the transcerebellar plane, uh, just a quick overview. So we will need to be able to see the frontal horns of both lateral ventricles, the cavum septum pellucidum, the thalami, the cerebellum, cisterna magna, the normal range of which is between two to 10 millimeters. The measurement of this, the important measurement is the transcerebellar diameter. Uh, and the abnormalities that can be excluded, obviously, are the spinal malform uh, malformations. By looking at the banana sign, I will not go through them because uh, we will mostly be speaking about the neck. So it's important to pay attention to the large cysts uh, or the big measurements of a uh, nuchal fold, uh, which need to be measured from the outer edge of the uh, occipital bone to the outer edge of the skin, which is visible at this, at this plane. So we, need to, we can exclude cystic hygroma and skin edema by this uh, method. In plane seven, we will have a look at the lungs, uh, and uh, as I told you, we will actually focus on the lungs in this talk. So we need to pay attention to the size, to the uh, actually the gain, which should be gray. So we can exclude abnormalities like left-sided diaphragmatic hernia, congenital pulmonary airway malformation, significant pleural effusion, and significant pericardial effusion. 
So these are again the some images of the planes that I spoke about. Um, the, the the upper image shows the transventricular plane. Uh, when we would like to uh, get the transcerebellar plane, as Professor Suresh nicely showed in his talk, we need to rotate our probe. So we need to bring both cavum, septum, pellicidum, and cerebellum into one image. From this image, actually, we need to slide our probe down to go to plane seven uh, and also plane six, which are four chamber view of the heart and three vessel view of the heart. And both planes are used to look at the lungs. So we need to visualize the lungs to pay attention to their color, which is basically gray and they are more or less symmetrical. The heart is uh, inclined to the left side. So that's why the right lung is a slightly bigger than the left lung, and this is normal. And also in three vessel view, we can see both lung fields. So again, the, the description of the planes here. Uh, so this is plane four and five transventricular and transthalamic uh, planes. And we need to rotate our probe to go to a transcerebellar plane, which is plane six. And here actually, we measure the, the thickness of the um, skin behind the neck. And from here, if we slide our probe down, we will go to four chamber view and three vessel view of the heart, which I will show you in my next slides. So this is the transcerebellar plane again. So the focal, we need to pay attention to the focal zone of our ultrasound device. Uh, the image needs to be at, at, at appropriate depth. The axial plane of the head uh, needs to be visualized. The folks uh, needs to be visualized again, uh, dividing the head into two symmetrical hemispheres. The cavum septum pellucidum is visible at the front at the front of the skull. Thalami and cisterna magna are also visible. Cerebellar hemispheres should be symmetrical in a normal fetus, and cerebellar vermis is also visible, so you don't see any fluid field area between the hemispheres of the cerebellum. From plane six, we slide down our probe and we go to plane seven, which is the four chamber view of the heart, and it is. A uh, very obvious and useful plane. It's uh, according to ESO guidelines. First, we go to plane seven. Uh, we find the four chamber view. We adjust our probe to see only one rib and the uh, symmetrical lung fields. And then we slide up the chest to reach the three vessel view. Again, a schematic depiction of the, the, the planes that I spoke about, plane six, transcerebellar, slide down to reach plane seven and go up to visualize the three vessel view of the heart. When we are in plane one or two, basically when we are visualizing the spine uh, at the sagittal or coronal view, sagittal is plane one, coronal is plane two, here, then we, we are in plane one or two, we need to rotate our probe to go to plane four, five, and six. And always when we find an abnormality, it is worthwhile to look at it from different planes. So if we see a new colloidoma or a cystic hygroma, it's worthwhile to go to, again, to plane one or two and to check things in all three planes, sagittal, coronal and transverse. So again, the depiction of the planes, have we find them? Now let's speak about the abnormalities that we might encounter when looking at these planes. So they are cystic hygromas, occipital encephalocele, and a skin edema. So this is a, a transcerebellar plane. As you can see, a cystic hygroma at 21 weeks. This is an accumulation of fluid, which is cystic. The right-hand side image shows a cystic hygroma at 13 weeks. Again, 
you see you can measure it the measurement of between the outer edge of the occipital bone and the outer edge of the skin is 10.5 the normal measurement is less than six millimeters and it's important to take this number in mind again some normal and abnormal images the left hand side image is a normal trans uh, cerebellar plane where you can visualize the skull bones, the falks, which divides the skull into two symmetric areas, the cavum septum pellucidum in, in front, the cerebellar hemispheres, the vermis, the cisterna magna, and the uh, skin of the neck. If it's been measured, we can see that it is less than six millimeters. The middle image shows an occipital encephalocele at 13 weeks. You see a bulge protruding out of the uh, back, back part of the um, skull. And again, an occipital encephalocele in, in a fetus, which should be between 18 to 20 weeks, you see again, a mass bulging out of the occipital bone and you can also see that the vermis is not formed. So you see some black area here, which is basically fluid. And this is a vermian agenesis. So again, some images, normal nuchal fold in the left-hand side image. The middle image shows a measurement of nuchal fold, which is more than six millimeters, and it shows a skin edema, and it needs proper investigation, it can be due to uh, chromosomal abnormalities, it can be due to infections. And in the right hand side image, if we usually get a very big nuchal fold, uh, it's, it usually signifies there is a probability of skin edema all over the baby. And actually, this is a baby which has had significant size uh, nuchal edema, and when we go down to plane seven and we look at the four chamber view of the heart, we can see a significant uh, skin edema around the chest too. Again, this baby needs to be refed and needs to be properly investigated for the uh, reason of this problem. Uh, this is a depiction of uh, the chest at the level of the four chamber view, plane seven basically. You can see nice four chamber view of the heart, uh, I told before that we uh, get, we obtain this image by sliding our probe from transcerebellar plane down the body. So we get to this image. Uh, these are just the normal appearances. We can see one complete rib here. We can see the four chamber of the uh, heart in the middle of the chest inclined to the left side. The apex points to the left side. And it occupies about one third of the chest of the chest area. We can see the lung fields, they are more or less symmetrical. They, they have a gray color, and we can't see any fluid field area either around the lungs or around the heart, i.e., no pleural or pericardial effusion. And in this schematic presentation, you can also clearly see the descending aorta, which is the most consistent structure. Uh, signifying the left side of the chest. It's important and it's, it's nice to have this in mind. Sometimes in isomerisms, it, it's very helpful. So which abnormalities can we pick up by looking at plane seven, this four chamber view of the heart? We can pick up left-sided diaphragmatic hernia, congenital pulmonary airway malformation or CPAM, significant pleural effusion, which is more than four millimeters, and significant pericardial effusion, again, more than four millimeters. And why we say four millimeters? Because in a low BMI patient, we can see some very small amount of the fluid around the lungs or the heart, which is normal if it is less than four millimeters. But more than four millimeters, we need to do proper investigation. So some uh, examples of uh, normal and abnormal cases. The middle image is the normal four chamber view. Uh, the uh, left hand side image shows a left sided diaphragmatic hernia. You can see the four chamber of the heart, which has been pushed toward the right side. And you see a black fluid field area in the left chest, basically, which is the stomach. And you can see this triangular shaped uh, play, the structure here, which is part of the liver. 
Again, in the right-hand side of the image, another left-sided diaphragmatic hernia. The same uh, markers, you see the left, uh, the default chamber view of the heart pushed to the right side, the fluid-filled stomach in the left hemithorax with a part of the liver visible here. This gray part actually at the back of the heart is the remaining lung in both images. And it's used for subprognostic measurements uh, for diaphragmatic hernia fetus. It's just it's good to know. About uh, congenital pulmonary airway malformation or CPAM, we have three types. The prevalence is one in 1,500 to 4,000 live births. It shows a male predominance. It can be diffused or localized. In type one, we see single or multiple large anechoic cysts with usually mediastinal shift. In type two, we see variable appearances depending on the composition of the malformation. And in type three, we see homogeneously solid masses with normal adjacent parenchyma. When seen antenatally, you see PAM, it, it has um, different uh, causes of progression. It might increase its size, it might remain stable throughout the pregnancy, and it might regress to the point it is no longer detectable by ultrasound. And as a CPAM may create a mass defect displacing the heart, the pregnancy should be followed to ensure there is no progression to high drops. Conversely, compression of normal lung tissue can result in pulmonary hypoplasia and postnatal surgery may be required with type one lesions offering the best prognosis. Some sample pictures on the left-hand side, you see the normal and uh, on the left, uh, I mean, the picture number two, shows a type 1 CPAM. You see some uh, different size cysts in the right lung. Uh, in the middle image, you see type 2 CPAM. You see um, some sort of mixed uh, cyst, mixed size cysts with hyperechogenic lung, uh, which has pushed actually the heart to the left side of the chest. And this is type 3 CPAM homogeneous and hyperechoic. Uh, these are some uh, example pictures of uh, plural and uh, plural effusions. Uh, the left-hand side image is normal for comparison reasons. The first image here shows significant left-sided plural effusion at 14 weeks. You can see some fluid feed area around the left lung and has pushed the heart to the right side. The middle image shows some uh, pleural effusion around the uh, right lung. You can see, and a rim of this pleural effusion goes to the back of the lung. This is not severe, but still needs a uh, proper workup. And the uh, right-hand side image shows significant bilateral pleural effusion. Uh, and you can see that the heart, the, the lungs are quite shrinked. It, it can be due to chromosomal problems, due to infections, due to uh, lymphatic vessel obstructions, and it needs proper follow-up. You can also see significant size skin edema here. These babies all need to be referred for further follow-up. Uh, again, the examples, you know, the comparison between what pleural effusion and pericardial effusion look like. Here you see fluid uh, around the lung. You see some fluid in front, a rim of it going to the back of the lung, no fluid area, no fluid field area around the heart. So this is a pleural effusion. And in this image here, you see fluid field area around the heart. This is pericardial effusion and the lung, the lungs have been pushed back. So the key points, uh, Sliding between planes six, seven, and ten allows identification of the most common pathologies of the neck and the chest. Always double verify echogenicity and homogeneity of the lungs. Your role is to distinguish between the range of normal and abnormal appearances. So anything that raises your suspicion, please refer the patient. 
any appearance which you cannot confirm as normal should be referred for a more experienced opinion. And I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I think we have about, I think we are about 15 minutes ahead of time. So I don't know if you would like to go for a break now or can we take some questions if there are any? Uh, we can take some questions and then uh, we stop for a break. Okay. Maybe 10 minutes uh, for question. Yes, sure. From the box uh, chat or from the QA. Okay, let me just stop sharing. Yeah. So again, questions about recordings. I think yesterday it has been answered that the delegates will be provided with some link for, for a month. So- The record, we uh, send it by email uh, for them or we can keep it also on the WhatsApp uh, group. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's a question in Q and, Q and answer part. Can a left-sided pleural effusion be confused with the left CBH? Um, I, I think this, this question is about my presentation, so I go ahead with answering. Actually, uh, in a left congenital diaphragmatic hernia, you see a fluid-filled stomach. So it is more or less round shape. Uh, I would say uh, you can diagnose it from a pleural effusion. Pleural effusion is around the lungs. So you see some black fluid filled area, which, uh, which you can see that it clearly occupies the area around the lungs. Sometimes it's, it might be in, in front of the lung, sometimes a rim of it goes back, but it is dis distinguishable, distinguishable from a fluid filled stomach. I'd like to know if any other of the uh, speakers uh, can add anything to my explanation. Well, I fully agree with you, Dr. Somas, because with a with a, a fluid around the left lung, you really can usually also distinguish actually the whole lung because the lung is sort of well, sort of swimming in the fluid, and that's really different from from diaphragmatic hernia. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, there are other questions in the chat. Uh, how can we, uh, okay. How can we know the right or left side in plane seven? Uh, I guess this is a, again about my lecture, but uh, anyway, Titi, I, I would be very happy if you go, go ahead with answering. if you would like to. Yes, well, you know, distinguishing left and right side is something that you have to do at the beginning of your scan. Right when you start to scan and you look at the fetus and determine what the lie of the fetus is, it is very good at that moment to also be aware that the left side of the fetus is actually presenting also the place where the stomach is and the place where the heart is. And in my talk, it will come back how you can do that, but, but it is something that I always do and I use myself and I go and lie in the position that the fetus does. So I know that my left side and it is up for instance, and it has also the heart and the lung on that side. So if you know that at the start of your scan, any time during your scan, uh, when you see something that is sort of querying, is this the left or the right side, you go back and you, you, you slide slightly up or down wherever you're looking and you see where the, um, uh, where the heart is and you had already established that the heart was in the correct position on the left side, then you know that it's the left side and the other side is the right side. It's really as easy as that. It's some discipline you have to do at the beginning of the scan. And it takes time to learn how to establish situs. But if you do that at the beginning of your scan, 
you will have so much, uh, uh, it's so efficient during the rest of the examination. I hope that answers the question. Thank you very much. It was very clear. Thank you. Uh, there's a question in the chat box. Uh, sometimes in breach presentation, it is difficult to measure BPD and HC. Any advice to get a better image in non-cephalic presentations? I wonder if Dr. Musa is willing to answer. Sorry, I was typing. What was the question? Okay, sometimes in breach presentation, it's difficult to measure BPD and HC. Any advice to get a better image? Yeah, this is, um, we have talked yesterday uh, and we have covered this about the probe movement. Um, when you have, like, for example, uh, you want to take the transverse section at transventricular plane for the head and brain, and you are in oblique, uh, the fetus in oblique uh, position or in breech uh, presentation, then what you need to do is to slide your probe on the uh, broad uh, axis of the broad, and that helps you to correct the plane from oblique to transverse. So it is a matter of understanding how the broad movements help you to correct uh, different planes from oblique to transverse or from oblique to horizontal in case of femur measurements. Thank you very much. And another question in the chat box. In the second trimester, if there is good light, uh, we can just wait for a while for the baby. Oh, sorry. This, this is just the answer of Professor Suresh. Sorry, I thought it's a question. So. I think we have covered the questions. No, there is one question. What is the measurement for neck edema? Um, that should what? be Dr. Mega. But I can answer that question. If you measure uh, the nuchal fold in the appropriate uh, plane, where you have the cavum septum and the cerebellum in view, and then you see the neck in, uh, in the back, you measure the, ma the, the, the neck thickness from the back of the skull to the back of the neck. And if that's more than six millimeters, it's abnormal until, and that is a measurement that only is val valuable between 16 and 24 weeks of gestation. After 24 weeks of gestation, you cannot use that. There is no real cutoff for that. And, um, uh, but in, in, in that time, it's six millimeters. And I always tell my people, you have to be very careful because sometimes people give a lot of pressure uh, while they're trying to get the measurement. And then if they give the pressure, it's like if you put, if you pressure your neck together, well, it will also become thick. So be sure not to make an you know an erroneous uh, thick neck. Um, and I prefer actually because this this upper mark is is uh, six millimeters. I prefer to say really if you have a thick neck, I prefer it if it is eight or nine millimeters and not six point two, because usually six point two. Is, is rather earlier an error than a real thick neck. But that's the technique to do it. And Dr. Megan, you probably have something to add to that. You're, you're muted. Yeah, okay, no, I, I agree with what you're saying. Uh, there is also another question for Dr. Mega. Uh, is it enough to see upper lip of fetus or we have, or do we have to see the nose, upper and lower lips, also to exclude cleft lips? The ESOG guideline clearly states that the minimum that you should see is the upper lip. Yeah, and that would be enough to exclude clefting of the lip. But when feasible, you should always have a look at the nose and the lower lip. And it's always better to practice and get all the claims so that as you grow along, it will just get better and easier. So though the upper lip only is enough, always try to see the entire face. 
Uh, there's another question about uh, what are the prognostic factors in congenital diaphragmatic hernia? How can we counsel the mother and take a decision on whether C-section should be avoided in cases of fetal compromise? Actually, this, is, this question is, I would say it's beyond the uh, scope of uh, this course, but however, just to, I think, to, to just not leave it unanswered, uh, that the volume of the remaining lung is important, but there are just so many papers about it. We, when, when I was a fellow, we used to measure something called LHR ratio. Uh, so just measuring the area of the lung, uh, dividing it by BPD. But nowadays, actually, there are some curves like observed to uh, expected volumes of the lung, volumes or areas of the lungs, and they, they just uh, produce some prognostic measurements to counsel the parents. But this is something that we need to refer the patients to tertiary care centers, and this needs to be done by experts in the field. I, I don't know if um, Dr. Titi or Dr. Musa would like to add anything. <laughs> Last week, I had a two-day conference on diaphragmatic hernia together with the prenatal people and the obstetricians and the, uh, uh, and the surgeons and the pediatricians who treat the babies afterwards. This is really an area where you need the experts and they sometimes discuss even, you know, there is chromosome anomalies and there is, uh, uh, do you have ECMO uh, availability? It is something that is, uh, you should never, uh, even try, if you don't have all the knowledge, try to give an estimate. Because if you give an estimate on prognosis before the person is referred, the patient will remember this and will think that that's the truth. And then it's very difficult for the experts to give the whole story. So I always think, you know, um, be modest in, in, in the knowledge that you have and leave, uh, you, you've seen it, it's an abnormality, that's great. And then you know it should be referred and, and people with, who deal with these patients uh, on, a, on a weekly, monthly basis, they are the ones to provide the prognosis. Thank you very much. And the last questions in the chat box, uh, should we look for thyroid gland when we are looking uh, at the fetal neck? Mm, actually, it's the thyroid gland abnormalities are quite, it, that can be picked up by looking at the thyroid gland are quite rare, if you would agree with me. So there are, in, in the whole my uh, experience, actually, I, I think I had just two babies having goiters in, inside the, uh, womb, obviously, if you see an abnormally hyperflexed neck, you, you, you look at the thyroid if it's big. And sometimes in cases of maternal um, Graves disease that the antibodies uh, cross the placenta, they go to the uh, baby and actually they produce uh, problems with the thyroid, big thyroids, you might see them. But I think, I believe on routine basis, we don't look at the thyroid. I don't know if you would agree with me. Yeah, uh, we agree with your point, actually. It's very, very rare. Uh, and uh, me, myself, I saw only one case. And you can see it easily, either as a mass or, as you said, um, with hyperflexion of the neck. I think we were together, actually, when we saw that case in room one in Kings. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, okay. All right. uh, I think it's uh, we are near the break time now. So, yeah, so we'll go for a break for 15 minutes and we are back by uh, 5.45 p.m. Okay.
هذه هذه الاوبشنز يا سوي ميو یه لحظه خواستم ببینم که این وسط این چیزشیم وسط این تنفس خواهد بکنم یه لحظه تموم شد ما من میگن که آخری من الان دارتان تصمیم نه آخری من باید به تو هیچی
I think we can start, Dr. Salmas. Sure. Um, thank you very much, uh, everyone. Our next two talks uh, will be by Dr. Titia Cohen, uh, because Dr. Jihad actually uh, had some uh, urgent uh, work to do and will not attend the rest of the webinar, but Dr. Titia will kindly take over. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Titia, uh, is very well known, everybody knows her and she has already been introduced yesterday. Uh, I just uh, do a very, very brief introduction. So, so Dr. Titia is the lead of uh, EZOC project in Oman. Uh, and I would ask you to start your lecture, Dr. Titia, over to you. Uh, thank you, Dr. So much for your uh, kind uh, introduction. Um, and we have, uh, I, I will do two um, lectures in one. Uh, maybe I have some coughing. Uh, just bear with me uh, because it's a long talk then if it's two behind each other. But we'll first start with examining the uh, abdomen and the anterior abdominal wall. Um, one of my favorite subjects. Uh, at the end of this lecture, you will be able to describe how to obtain the two planes required to access the fetal abdomen and the anterior abdominal wall correctly. You recognize the differences between the normal and most common abnormal ultrasound appearances of the abdomen and the anterior abdominal wall. Now, at the end, you will be able to answer the key questions. What are the key ultrasound features of plane 11? And what are those of plane 12? And what probe movements are required to get from plane 11 to plane 12? And which abnormal abnormality should be excluded after correct assessment of both planes? Well, again, this uh, slide must be very familiar to you, the 20 plus two planes. And we have now discussed um, the overview and the, the head and um, uh, we had the thorax, uh, and we come now to the uh, to the abdomen. Um, so let me, uh, and we come particularly to plane 11 and 12. How do we get there? Well, um, we didn't have the heart le lecture yet, but if you are in the thorax and you have a cross section across the thorax, you, you will come high in the thorax at level 10, where you have three vessel view of the heart. And when you, it's really one of the easiest planes to get, plane 11 and plane 12, because you just have to slide down the spine to get from plane 10 to plane 11, and then slide down a bit more to get to plane 12. But obviously the baby will not lie all the time still, so to make it easy. So you have to be a bit of aware how to adapt to the baby's position. It's not all that easy. Um, but what are the requirements of this plane? Well, uh, plane 11 is a transfer section across the stomach and the umbilical vein. And what's one of the most important things here? You can determine the abdominal situs and you can uh, measure the abdominal circumference. And uh, you have to know what are the criteria for the abdominal circumference and then which abnormalities can you diagnose or exclude? Well, in the first place, obviously an abnormal abdominal situs, and this is something you must know at the beginning of your scan. You will be aware if the stomach is small or absent, you might uh, be dealing with an esophageal atresia, but it might also be normal. You might be dealing with a duodenal atresia, with a situs and with skin edema. And if you go slightly lower, you get a cross section of the abdomen at the level of the cord. You will very clearly see a cord insertion. And if the cord insertion is abnormal, you may be dealing with an omphalocele and we'll show you images of that or with a gastroschisis, which is a completely different anomaly with a totally different prognosis. 
So beware of the difference of those two abnormalities. Here you see actually the, um, uh, uh, in a diagram, the, the level of the abdominal circumference and of the uh, level of plane 11, which is just below the diaphragm, where indeed you must be able to identify the stomach and the intrahepatic umbilical vein, and where you then can measure the abdominal circumference. And I hope you are aware that this is a true cross section and slide a bit more down. You come at the level of the umbilical cord where you can determine if the abdominal wall is intact. Now, um, the ultrasound features of the cross section of the abdomen is the umbilical vein at the level of the portal sinus where it sort of enters into the liver, the umbilical vein where it sort of enters into the portal sinus in the liver, that's what I mean. And then you are most often seeing the stomach bubble on the left side if the situs of the fetus is normal. And in this level, you must be aware that the kidneys should not be visible. If the kidneys are visible, you are too low. And here is an image how you can move from plane 11 to plane 12, and you will also identify plane 11. Plane 11 is the plane of the abdominal circumference. And if you see this video moving, we start with the heart, you come with the stomach, umbilical vein, portal sinus, kidneys, umbilical cord insertion, and down in the pelvis of the fetus where you even have the bladder. And we go up again, we see the kidneys, we see the stomach, we see the umbilical vein and the portal sinus, and there we have the heart and we are in the thorax. So if the baby is really nice, it will let you see all those features which you should be, and here's the, the, the kidney, and there was a kidney, cord insertion, we will go up again, bladder, and I'll show you the kidney on this side. It's, yes, that's right there in the stomach and the umbilical vein and the heart again. So those are the features that you are looking for. And to show you in a still, it is slightly easier. Here you have the stomach, you see a single rib and you see also a single rib here. And at this place you see a more elongated area of the umbilical vein where it is just will go and enter here the portal sinus, but you don't see the portal sinus here. You see the spine at the back of the baby and the aorta in a cross section, which is on the left side of the spine. And very important, the inferior vena cava, which you can also see, which is in front of the aorta and more on the right side in the abdomen. That position of those two vessels is important if you are dealing with any situs abnormalities. And we'll come to that in a minute. Um, and the other thing is what I want to show you, you see now two complete ribs and you see also a bit of an elongated area of the umbilical vein. This is not what we want to see when you do an abdominal circumference measurement, because if you see an, uh, two long ribs, then you really know that you're having an oblique uh, measurement, an, an oblique cross section because your ribs don't, uh, they are not completely transverse. They are also having, they come from the spine down in an oblique way. So if you see a complete a rib, you know that your cross section is not transverse, but is uh, oblique. So how do you sort of get this? You try to get the abdominal circumference as circular as possible, not two long ribs and you get a very short length of the umbilical vein, sort of at one third within the abdomen at the level of the portal sinus. You see the, uh, the stomach and you sort of have to slide up and down and rotate sometimes a bit and sometimes have you, you have to angle a bit to get to the correct place and you make sure that there are no kidneys. And this indeed, is an ideal circumference for the umbilical, uh, for the abdominal circumference, where you see the portal vein or the umbilical vein just entering here, the portal sinus. And 
if you do a measurement, you do a measurement. Unfortunately, this is not completely as I would want it. This red rim should be around the skin of the um, uh, of the abdomen. And I, I'm sure I'm, I'm sorry I couldn't correct it, but it should be around the skin of the abdomen. And you, in most ultrasound machines have an uh, opportunity to make an ellipse and to make an ellipse you put your, your your arrow right up here and right below here where you would see the rim of the tummy and then you can make the ellipse go wide and you sort of use your um your 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 eyeballing to make sure that it goes completely around the stomach sometimes it's a bit difficult sometimes it's on one side a bit out but then you have to make sure that's on the other side if it would be here a bit on the outside, you make sure that it's on this side a bit on the inside. And there's another way to measure this, and that's by taking a cross-section, an anterior posterior cross-section and a transverse cross-section. And then there is a formula, and that formula is that the abdominal circumference is the, uh, is the uh, anterior posterior plus the transverse diameter and you multiply that by 1.57 and you get the abdominal circumference. So this is another way to very safely measure the abdominal circumference. Um, now, uh, what are the features of plane 12? That's the transverse view, where again, you have a spine and you have the cord insertion right here and you see that the abdominal wall is completely closed. There is nothing protruding and you're right above the level of the bladder. You shouldn't see the bladder at this level. And if you want to make sure that you're looking at it correctly, you can add some color Doppler and you see that the flow of the arteries going in or out and or they, they, they should actually go out, but it depends on the position towards the probe, which color they have and you can actually would be able to follow them later, but that's in the next lecture on the Euro uh, genital uh, uh, organs, how you get the umbilical arteries around the um, bladder. Now, it is extremely important, as it was already mentioned in the previous lecture, that you have to make sure that the situs of the fetus is normal. And this is not only the abdominal situs, but also the, the situs of the heart. If you're dealing with a cephalic baby, and yesterday Dr. Musa mentioned uh, how you have to hold your probe and what is on the left side on the screen is on the right side of the mother. So if you see a, a spine on this side, this means that you're looking here to the right side of the mother and the spine is on the right side of the mother and you know it's a cephalic position because you have determined that the cephalic is down at the pubic os of the mother, then you can actually, what I usually do is I use myself as a fetus and I lie down, and this is what I do at the beginning of every scan, I lie down, well, I sit next to the patient and scan, but I just move myself and think, oh, now I'm in the cephalic position, my head is down, then, the upper side, this side of me is my left side. And on the left side, I know from, in my case, there is the heart and the stomach, and that should be in a normal fetus also like that. So you identify the stomach, the, sorry, you identify the heart and the stomach on the left side in a cephalic position. Now, um, and you know, it depends where the back of the baby is, obviously. In this case, we know we are looking at a breech position. We had determined that at the, uh, at the start of the scan. And when you are in a breech position, and again, the back on the right side of the mother, I could do the same thing. I could move myself being in a breech, the right side of the mother. And then I would know the, the side upper nearest to the transducer is my right side. And that would, this side is nearest to the transducer. There is the transducer. That should be my right side. And I shouldn't see a stomach there. So in this case, there is an abnormal abdominal situs. However, the heart is on the left side as it should be. 
And so in this case, there is a, a situs and versus with a levocardia with the heart still on the correct side. So that's important to know. And if you know this at the start of your scan, you will not get confused in any other way. I mean, it's, it's difficult enough to deal with a situs abnormality, but you know, you, it's therefore important that you should be aware of that at the start of every scan. Now, there are various ways how to define the situs. And I, uh, I use myself because I'm always there and, uh, and I'm always the one that is doing the scan if I'm there, so, so it's easy for me. But there are other ways. You can also use a little doll. Some people have a little doll with them and they put the doll in the position of the fetus and then decide what is the left side of the fetus and whether the stomach and the uh, heart is on the left side or not. But you can also have this right hand rule of thumb. And that's a very good rule for trans abdominal scanning. So there's lots of ways to do this. And I'll explain how this uh, this right hand rule of thumb for scanning um, works. If you have your hand in front of you, your right hand, this is my right hand, then you must think of the back of your hand as the back of the baby. The palm of your hand is the abdomen of the baby. The top of your hand, the fist, is the head of the baby. And the thumb, your thumb is now indicating to the left. So if you have a baby which is in a breech position like this and then uh, and with the head up and the spine towards the right side of the mother, then my thumb is the left side. So on the distal side of the baby, I should be seeing the stomach and the heart and then the situs would be correct. So this you can use this also for a cephalic position. If, for instance, you turn around your, your arm and, for instance, if the um, it, it's a bit more difficult to show on a screen, it's easier to show if you're in a lecture hall. But I mean, please try and do this also. If you have the baby with an inner vertex position, so with the head down and with the right side to the mother with the back, then my thumb is going up. So I know in this case, that the heart and the stomach should be nearest the transducer, like I just explained. And you can use this with the back on the left side of the mother in a breech and in a vertex position also. So this is an easy way to do. Try it yourself with your arm. And, and you will also know the thumb is the left side. And that's easy to remember. So there's various ways to do this. And I don't let my residents say at the beginning of the scan, when they say, and when I ask them, you know, can you determine the position of the baby? You know, is it a breech position or a vertex position? They say, oh, it's a vertex position. And then they go on scanning, they look for the placenta. And then I always stop them. And I say, okay, you said it was a vertex position, is left, left, and is right, right. And then of course, when they're young residents, it's five minutes quiet, because they have to start to figure out how am I going to figure this out? And I hope, and, 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 but if you teach them, and if you teach yourself and you make it a, a, a rule of thumb to always do this at the beginning, then within you know, 15, 10 to 15 seconds, you've done it. And then you're clear for the rest of the scan. Because if you want to look at kidneys, for instance, and one kidney is abnormal, and then you think, ooh, was this the right or was this the left kidney? Ah, just slide upwards and see, oh, the stomach is on that side. So, you know, it, I'm dealing with the right side or, or I'm dealing with the left side. And it's much easier. If you see something on a leg that you think, oh, is abnormal, and you forgot, oh, the baby has moved around all the time. Is it now the right or the left leg? Well, then you know the leg, you move upwards and you see where the stomach is and you know the side is then immediately so you can identify if you're dealing with the left and the right side. I have found this during my career extremely um, valuable to do that. And I think everybody should do that. It's not only me and many other people uh, who are experienced do this. Um, so um, what, now we come to the abnormalities. What do you do if you don't see a stomach? And for instance, in this case, we're looking at the breech position with the, um, uh, the back uh, to, the left side, to the left side of the mother. So we should see 
the stomach right up here, uh, because yes, we're, we're, we're like that. And it's the, the left side, we should see a stomach and there's no stomach there. So what do you do? And there's normal amniotic fluid. Well, most likely it's just uh, temporarily emptying and it has no clinical significance. And it's nice to look at the beginning of your scan also to, do, to the, uh, determine the situs, because then you still have the whole scan to wait for the stomach to fill and you can do all the other things and then move back to the abdomen and see, oh, the stomach is filled well, so there's no problem at all, or it hasn't filled, filled and then maybe you are dealing with a problem. On the other hand, you can also identify the stomach whilst you're scanning in a completely different position where you hadn't expected it. For instance, right here, also on the left side, but then really quite near the heart. That is not what we want to see. And this is just what the Psalmas uh, was discussing. And in this case, you will know, you get suspicious and you think this is not normal. I might be dealing with an abnormality. It might even be a diaphragmatic hernia. Uh, and so you will not be seeing your abdomen, your stomach in your abdomen, which might be challenging if you want to measure an abdominal circumference, but that's then the next thing. Um, so uh, the other thing is you might encounter abnormal fluid collections. So uh, for instance, an enlarged stomach or dilated bowel loops or cysts or ascites. And um, if you're looking at that, you see here a, uh, um, a uh, uh, sorry, a, a deep pool of amniotic fluid, um, and you might encounter uh, dilated uh, loops of bowel, and um, oh, uh, which also are seen right there, dilated loops of bowel. Bowel should not never be so dilated and. Um, uh, or you might encounter a cyst right there, or you might encounter a situs, which is right there, which you don't want to see. Um, so uh, if we look uh, at these abnormalities, which we might encounter in the uh, gastrointestinal tract, uh, you know, you might be dealing with a diaphragmatic hernia if you're not seeing a stomach. You might be dealing with an esophageal atresia if there is a absent stomach or persistently small stomach, or you might be dealing with a small bowel obstruction like a pyloric atresia, which is extremely rare, duodenal atresia, urinal atresia, you might be dealing with those. And particularly when you encounter polyhydramnios. Now, why would a fetus develop polyhydramnios when there is a gastrointestinal obstruction? Well, the fetus is all the time swallowing. And whilst it is swallowing, it's also absorbing the amniotic fluid within its gastrointestinal tract. And that is very important to know because funnily enough, duodenal atresia, which is one of the most common gastrointestinal obstructions, only becomes evident uh, in the, um, you, well, in, in, in the approximately more, over, more than 70% of cases becomes evident uh, in the third trimester. And why is that? Well, that actually is because there is still enough um, uh, gastrointestinal tract, depending on the level of the obstruction for the baby to absorb the amniotic fluid. And so there will not appear any polyhydramnios. And that is obviously even more so if the uh, obstruction in the gastrointestinal tract is more distal uh, from the mouth where the baby is swallowing. So if you see a ileum uh, obstruction, or a colonic obstruction, you will, it's very difficult to encounter, but you will never uh, encounter or hardly ever polyhydramnios. Coming back to esophageal atresia, <coughs> it has a frequency of a, about one in 3,500 live birth, uh, but a very low detection rate. And you sometimes are aware because there is polyhydramnios or an absent stomach, but 85% of the cases with an esophageal atresia have a fistula from the trachea 
to the stomach. So if the baby is not able to swallow the fluid through the uh, esophagus, it will go through the trachea and then, then we will go through this fistula to the stomach. And then you might not be aware of this anomaly at all. Um, so that's why it is not, and, and as 85% has a fistula, uh, it, that's why this anomaly is often missed by ultrasound prenatally. Um, here, actually, you see the pouch of the, uh, in the pharynx where the esophagus is, uh, has an atresia. And you might think that this is the uh, esophagus. Well, that's not true. This is the trachea. And the trachea always, you can detect it because it has sort of a cartilage rings around it. And therefore, it's always open and there's always fluid in it. Whereas in the esophagus, there's only fluid when the baby swallows. So the moment the baby swallows and you are so lucky to see it and you have the optimal uh, insonation of the, uh, of the esophagus, you might be able to encounter the fluid going down to the stomach, but that is so rare. It's so difficult to catch. There are some very nice images on, on, on the website where you can find this, but it's really, I mean, I, I tried for ages to get this measurement. I have it once somewhere, but it is difficult. Um, so be aware that you cannot see the esophagus because the esophagus is collapsed. There's nothing in it. It is collapsed unless fluid goes through it. And uh, therefore, it, you, you, you will not be able to identify esophageal astresia by looking at the esophagus. Uh, it's the indirect signals. Um, now, coming to an abnormal stomach, uh, and, and the, uh, for instance, the duodenal atresia, um, you see here a, a dilated, uh, well, a, a stomach slightly dilated, and then you see a, a cyst next to it. And this might, and if you see this at 20 weeks, that's quite early, but approximately 50% of all duodenal atresias are able to, to see at that gestational age but certainly not all of them, certainly not all of them. Um, the prevalence is about one in 10,000. And of all those, approximately 20 to 40% have trisomy 21. So you always have to offer invasive procedures to find out if that is the case. There is an increased perinatal mor morbidity and uh, also mortality. Uh, and also, uh, particularly, sometimes you encounter um, a prematurity due to the polyhydramnios that develops, uh, and sometimes associated anomalies that are there. Um, and this is an image of an uh, esophagus uh, of a duodenal atresia in the sec in the third trimester. The baby is lying the other way around. Here you see a very large stomach, but what is important is that you can actually encounter the connection between the duodenum and the stomach. The stomach here, the pylor is there, and this structure is the gallbladder. It's a different structure, not collected in any other way. But always try to find a connection between the stomach and the duodenum, and that's the, per and the pylorus, and it should be there. Uh, here we see it again. If we um, continue to the next, then uh, we get a small bowel uh, atresia. And uh, for instance, we have here a longitudinal section where you very clearly see the diaphragm and the heart, you see the stomach, and you see this dilated structure, and that might be certainly bowel, and this is a still image, but you must be aware that the small bowel during the pregnancy should not be more than six millimeters wide. The colon, on the other hand, is 20 millimeters. Sorry, uh, can be 20 millimeters wide, but you will only encounter the colon very clearly in third trimester of pregnancy. And um, uh, what is the great difference between the small intestines like the eunum and the ileum and the colon? is that the yayunum and ileum have peristalsis, like you can see here on the screen. In this case, it's dilated ileum atresia. And the uh, uh, colon never shows uh, um, uh, movement like this, like peristalsis like this. So that's how you can 
certainly uh, make a differentiation between these two. And it is extremely rare to encounter a colonic atresia prenatally. It's possible, but it's rare to pronounce it prenatally. Hmm. Another anomaly is the hyperechogenic bowel loops. Sometimes you make an image and you encounter bowel, you encounter in the bowel, this is a, a coronal section, an area that is really bright, bright wet, white. And if it is bright white, the thing you can do is you can turn back the gain and still think, is it bright white? If it is as, and can, then what you should do is compare it to bone. And actually here you have ribs, you can compare it this white area to the ribs or to the uh, uh, bones of the, the ilia crest, which you see here. And you, you can say, okay, and you can actually see that right here and here. If it is as bright as bone, then we're dealing with a um, hyperechogenic bowel. And that's a nasty diagnosis, which you can only make uh, before 24 weeks of gestation. Particularly, it's a marker of ultrasound. It may be idiopathic and a normal variant, but it has also a higher risk of trisomy 21. You have a one to 2% risk of having a baby with trisomy 21. There may be an infection like a, site, a, a CMV infection, a parvo infection, toxoplasmosis. There may be cystic fibrosis. So this is a diagnosis, and there may be actually evidence of, a gastro, of an obstruction that will only become evident later in gestation, uh, a gastrointestinal obstruction later in gestation. So this, I always find it very difficult if I have to tell people that there's a, a hyperechogenic bowel loops, because you have to tell them this whole story, and, um, but it can also be normal. So they are worried for a time to sort out all these issues, and then they have to come back at 30 weeks to find out if, if they all were normal, whether the intestines are developing normal or whether it is also can be associated with growth restriction or whether some bowel obstruction is developing. So it's a nasty thing you encounter. And what we do in our tertiary clinic, actually, if we see this, we never diagnose it on our own. We think it's very subtle. You may be subjective in one way or another. So I always, and, I, and we always have sort of three, four scanning rooms. So I always ask one of my colleagues to come in and say, you know, uh, I just want your opinion, have a look at, at, the, at the abdomen and see what you think. And then I don't tell them what I have decided, whether it's hyperechogenic or not, but I want them to decide on their own. And if they have the same decision, okay, then we come to uh, uh, informing the parents about it. Um, and in this case, it was a primary CMV infection in, uh, at 19 weeks gestation, which is not nice to have. Uh, to have. Um, well, then there are various uh, abdominal cysts you may encounter from the reproductive tract. And, and then it's important to know the gender because uh, one of the most common cysts is the ovarian cyst, which you usually only see in the third trimester and, and sometime beyond 24 weeks. If you see it before 24 weeks, it's highly likely to not be an ovarian cyst and it should be something else. You may have a, a bowel duplication. You have a mesentery cyst. It may be a cyst of renal origin, of biliary origin, or any other thing. And in this case, you see here the stomach, you see here the gallbladder, and this cyst was actually a, a colitical cyst and it needed referral to sort out. Um, then we come to the abdominal wall defects. An abnormal... Uh, Abdominal wall is uh, when the uh, cord insertion is not completely normal and you see actually some tissue protruding. And in this case, it looks like there is small bowel protruding uh, within the umbilical cord. In this case, the, in, in, in which case, if the whatever is protruding from the bowel is within the umbilical cord or has tissue around it, then we're dealing with an omphalocele. And it may have a small abnormality like only bowel, or it may be very large with also liver in it. And it is always membrane uh, covered. It is easy to diagnose in a prenatal detection rate. Well, it says 80%, I guess, you know, with more and more experience, it, it will probably improve to 90, 95%. But be aware, an omphalocele 
is in 50% of the cases associated with chromosome anomaly, particularly trisomy 18, which is a lethal anomaly. So uh, not all omphaloceles will, uh, and, and uh, many of these will die during pregnancy or right after pregnancy. So it is important to find out if there is any other associated anomalies with this uh, abnormality, and uh, because that is in, indeed very important for the management of the pregnancy. Here, you have a very early uh, fetus of less than 12 weeks, and we're looking at a, a protrusion in this case. And we already saw examples of that yesterday in the lecture of Dr. Solmas on the, four, on the 10 to 14 weeks, where it is very normal um, between the period of, of, of nine and a half and 11 uh, weeks that you see a protrusion within the abdominal cord because at that stage, the intestines are growing extremely rapidly and the, uh, the area within the abdomen is not sufficient for them. So there is a period of time that they sort of, when they are, are growing and when they are obtaining their length, they need the inside of the umbilical cord to be able to develop. But then around 11 and a half weeks, they turn back and have their rotation within the abdomen and get their normal position for the rest of their lives. So, if you see a protrusion like this before 12 weeks of gestation, it's most likely you're dealing with a physiological herniation. And you should never, ever see liver uh, protruding. That should not be within the umbilical cord. And this, of course, is an example of a very large uh, omphalocele uh, where you indeed, if you make a cross section of the baby, you can see that there is lots of tissue. There is stomach and uh, liver also protruding and there's hardly anything left within the abdomen. And this is a very serious uh, case. You, you have to be um, aware that you're not also dealing with other anomalies and that you're not dealing with a carogram. And babies with this anomaly have problems with their lungs because there has not been enough uh, and they may develop also lung hypoplasia. And if you have a good look at this baby, you can see that it also has a cleft lip. So most likely that there were quite a number of other problems. Um, then the last uh, abdominal wall defect is the uh, gastroschisis, completely different of origin. Uh, it is an abnormality that is usually developing on the right side of the umbilicus where the abdominal wall is not closed and the intestines are free floating within the amniotic fluid. You can already identify that from approximately 11 and a half and 12 weeks. And we think that it has a vascular origin that the abdominal wall is not optimal formed and therefore a defect may occur through which the intestines flow freely in the um, amniotic fluid. This baby is lying the other way around where you see the umbilical cord and you see here the, uh, um, the uh, uh, intestines moving out. And if you encounter that later in pregnancies, the uh, intestines may become slightly more dilated. Now, in this case, this does not mean that there is a, uh, uh, an atresia. There could be an atresia, but it is not. It doesn't have to be like that. There is just much more space for the intestines to sort of become wider. Uh, it's an abnormality, which is about the frequency of one in, in 3000. It occurs often with young mothers um, and often when they don't have a very good uh, socioeconomical status, unfortunately, usually there is a, a, most often there is a normal carrier type. Most are isolated. Um, they may develop uh, intrauterine growth restriction in the course of pregnancy and oligohydramnios, and there is a risk of late intrauterine fetal death. So we would always monitor these pregnancies very uh, closely from 30, weeks, from 30 weeks onwards. Beware of the normal cord insertion, only bowel within the amniotic, flu free, uh, amniotic fluid that is free floating and they need referral. So the key points of this lecture are sliding from the chest through the abdomen to the pelvis in a transverse view. You can document the stomach, 
uh, absence of amniotic am, ab, or abnormal fluid collections within the abdomen, you, you can identify both kidneys and you identify the umbilical cord insertion. You have to, um, if the stomach is not fine or it is small, wait for a while and try and identify it at then uh, at a later stage because most often uh, you're not dealing with an anomaly, but it is just uh, temporarily empty. Um, be aware that you do accurate measurement uh, on a cross section and not an oblique section uh, where we don't want the umbilical vein. It could be completely visible. It shouldn't be like that. And do a prompt referral if you see a herniation of the bowel after 12 weeks or if you see abnormal fluid collections within the abdomen uh, um, and during uh, gestation. Now, that was my talk on um, uh, the abdomen. Uh, I'm just taking a, a, a short, short break, <laughs> not very long, just to drink something. And then we will go on on the next talk, which is distinguishing between normal and abnormal fetal size and growth pattern in singleton and twin pregnancies. Um, uh, again, the learning objective is that um, at the end of the lecture, lecture, you will be able to use ultrasound to distinguish between normal and abnormal growth patterns in singleton and twin pregnancies. And the key questions you will be able to answer are what maternal conditions are most frequently associated with abnormal growth pattern? What measurements should be taken to assess fetal growth correctly? What are the typical ultrasound features of poor fetal growth? And why? And what are the typical features of a macrosomic fetal growth? And how is fetal growth assessed in twin pregnancies? Now, we have very different growth patterns. Obviously, 90% uh, of the population has a normal growth, or it's probably 80% of the population has a normal growth pattern but we may encounter macrosomia and we may encounter fetal growth restriction. And if we look at these two images, this is a baby which is clearly growth restricted. This is a normal healthy baby. And if we put the two together here, then this is the normal healthy baby. And this is the macrosomic baby of more than five kilograms. And how to distinguish these two different patterns in ultrasound? What do we do? Well, we must be aware of one thing is that boys and girls have different birth weight uh, uh, through pregnancy. We know that and there are um, graphs for that. And uh, funnily enough, although we know that boys and girls have a different uh, type of uh, P5 and P95, during pregnancy, we use the same graph for estimating the growth. Fetal growth has an Im immense impact on late in our lives. And that was particularly found out by Professor Barker in the United Kingdom, who encountered a cohort of men uh, and, and, and women also that were very secure, very precisely monitored uh, during the war in England and right in the period after the war, where there was uh, also more infants with growth restrictions through various reasons. And because these people didn't move from their area of living, they could follow them up to the rest of their lives. And they found out that if you have growth restriction during the fetal period, you have a much higher risk of developing diabetes, hypertension uh, later on and and all sorts of other uh, systemic uh, problems, uh, which really find their origin in fetal life. So it's important that we are aware of this and we try to make the, uh, the condition for the fetus as optimum as possible to, for um, normal development. Now, how do we detect abnormal growth? You can do a clinical assessment for instance, by looking at the maternal, uh, at the measurements of the uh, fundal height. But then if you were encountering fetal growth restriction, you would only encounter approximately 50% of the cases and certainly not all percent. 
You may be aware of the maternal risk factors. It's important. Is she a smoking mother? Is she has a, um, does she have underlying disease such as hypertension or diabetes, uh, which will uh, influence the growth of the baby? It's important to take into your uh, assessment. And then you have by ultrasound. And for biometry, we principally use head circumference and abdominal circumference to encounter, to measure growth and development. And to estimate fetal weight, we can take the biparietal the diameter, the head circumference, the abdominal circumference, and the fetal length. And also measuring of the amniotic fluid is important, either by an amniotic fluid uh, uh, index or by a deepest uh, pool, because the amnio uh, having a normal amount of amniotic fluid around the baby, it tells you something about the condition of a baby. A baby who is too large often has a lot of amniotic fluid and a baby who is too small and really growth restriction has an oligohyremnios and is, has reduced amniotic fluid. So the amount of amniotic fluid tells you something about the well-being of a, an infant. And so it's important to take that into your consideration. Now, uh, there are various ways to estimate fetal weight and um, ultrasound is superior to the clinical estimation of the fetal weight before 37 weeks of gestation. Afterwards, actually, uh, your clinical uh, estimation and your ultrasound are approximately will be the same. However, if you measure an estimated fetal weight by ultrasound, you are, and, and you use the charts that are available to you, you are you you give a measurement of say this baby is now 2300 grams it will actually be plus or minus 10 percent of the actual birth weight uh, take that into consideration you are never that precise you're obviously heavy if you're happy if at one stage you can be very precise but it's not a, it's it's normal that it's it's not always completely accurate and uh, the remainder, actually, some are uh, within 20% of the actual birth weight. And that, unfortunately, hasn't changed. This, this figure, although this was seen in uh, 98, 98 already, and, and we haven't really been able to improve that very much. Um, and I hope one of the things that we can do is to improve is that we actually teach everybody and everybody knows how important it is to take your measurement accurately. Uh, that is the first thing to do if you do that by ultrasound. Now, what is the best way to estimate fetal weight in a formula? We use the Hadlock formula most often where we use head circumference, abdominal circumference and fetal length. And this was published already in 1985 and it is still used all over the world. There are other uh, estimated fetal weight standards like the intergrowth, uh, and you can also use those. Uh, and here, for instance, is um, uh, how you are going to monitor your growth also depends on the graphs you are using. And the next time you go to your clinic, I want you to uh, really look very seriously at what type of graphs you are using. And it would be my ideal if everybody in one country uses the same graph, because it makes quite a difference if you plot your measurements on one graph and somebody else plots the same measurements on another graph. On one graph, it may be growth restriction. On the other graph, it might be within normal range. That really can make such a difference. So in one country, I mean, in the Netherlands, I can tell you where I work. I think it took us five years at least from the moment that we started that we say everybody has to use the same graph until that was possible. And I hope uh, in Oman, everybody is using the same graph and everybody in Iran is also using the same graph because you get confusion if you don't. Uh, the Intergrowth Project was a project that uh, was established around the world in uh, various areas, various geographical areas around the world where they only selected mothers that were healthy uh, that were in a, in, a, in uh, had no risk factors at all, and those were monitored 
throughout pregnancy to establish growth. And it was interesting that there was hardly any difference if you looked at the growth patterns of the fetuses where these mothers were super uh, selected and normal, what the, that, that from all the fetuses development of growth was within this range. And so this is also the intergrowth uh, uh, you can also use. It, it doesn't really matter as long as everybody uses the same graphs. That's important. Now, the formula, there are also very much formula to estimate fetal weight. And these formulas have been investigated very uh, thoroughly. And it was proven that, and, and you know, the estimate of fetal weight, you take the head circumference, the abdominal circumference, and the femur length. And it was proven that actually the head log three, which takes into account the uh, head circumference, abdominal circumference, and femur length, is the most um, uh, secure to and has the least errors in estimating fetal weight. And you can see that the percentage of error of this graph is really sort of around uh, zero and, and uh, within 2% of zeros until you get beyond uh, three kilograms, then all of a sudden uh, it will uh, get more errors, er errors, errors. So um, uh, beware, try to use the head log three to estimate the fetal weight and but beware that if you go beyond three kilograms, you may have more errors, but that is purely just, yes, that, that is purely because it gets more probably difficult to get the measurements. But then again, you, uh, you also uh, are probably in the safe, the safe area for a fetus. Um, so there is no, uh, what I tried to tell you already, there's no international agreement on uh, which graphs to use, but use the local charge or be sure that in your country or in your referral area, everybody is using the same charge, but use the formula for the headlock to estimate the fetal weight. Now we come to small for gestational age and, and fetal growth restriction. Uh, there is a difference. Uh, and what is the difference? Because a small for gestational age is, is uh, below the 10th centile, but actually is constitutionally small and is a healthy infant. Quite a big difference with a fetal growth restriction, uh, which refers to poor growth of the fetus. This fetus could have attained better growth and there is a high risk of adverse outcome. It is difficult to distinguish between the two because there is an overlapping area between the two. And how are you going to distinguish between those two? Well, in the first place, what's very important that you all should be correct dating. So between the best thing is between 10 and 14 weeks in the first trimester to date uh, the pregnancy because that's the most correct way. Use correct measurements. Be sure that if you do your measurements that you have the proper planes and you're not sort of taking a measurement when the plane is not right, because then you get a measurement which is not right, and then you may make a problem that is not there. Uh, use the correct tools to assess your uh, biometry. So use correct uh, plots to, to measure and, and beware that you are uh, using correct measurements. Uh, and then once you have decided whether there is fetal growth restriction or small for gestational age. And for, in tools, I also mean, uh, for instance, the Doppler you, you are going to use. Um, uh, make sure that you have an appropriate measurement for the clinical situation. So to distinguish between small for gestational age and fetal growth restriction, a fetal growth restricted fetus usually also has abnormal Doppler. It has small measurements, of the head circumference, abdominal circumference, and the fetal length, but it will also have small umbilical artery uh, dopplers. And in this case, there's no end diastolic flow, and there is even reverse end diastolic flow. Uh, and already, you know, you will, we will, you will measure the pulsatility index, and these are extreme forms, but there are milder forms where uh, there is still some end diastolic flow, but it is raised. Um, a raised pulsatility index, and tomorrow you will get the lecture about that. Or oh, not tomorrow, next week, but you will get the lecture about that. And you may have abnormal uh, 
uh, measurements in the uh, middle cerebral artery where there is an increased uh, end diastolic flow, which indicates that the baby is redirecting its blood flow to its most vital organs, which are the heart and the, and, and the head, and the head is easy to measure. And in an end stage, uh, this is an end stage, you can even encounter abnormal um, uh, ductus venosus with reverse flow. And that really, if the baby is showing that, then really it's becoming hypoxic. Um, you can also measure between 20 and 24 weeks the uterine artery and encounter a notch. And this is an evidence, this is evidence that the uterine circulation had not developed normally and uh, the, all the vessels towards the placenta are not open and providing ample blood flow and uh, nutrients to the fetus. And this is what you encounter in high-risk pregnancies. And if you encounter this, you're dealing with fetal growth restriction and not with a small for gestational age fetus who is actually uh, normal. So a small for gestational age fetus has uh, measurements between the third and the 10th percentile, but it has normal Doppler studies in the umbilical artery, uh, uterine artery, and the middle cerebral artery, contrary to the fetal growth restriction, who is less than the third tensile, or it's less than the 10th tensile, but with the abnormal changes in Doppler, which I just showed. So, uh, it is important to, uh, if you think you're looking at a fetal growth restriction, don't measure only once, but you need to repeat your measurements to see how the growth is developing. And then you want to repeat it quickly because you think, ah, then, then I know what's going on. No, you shouldn't do that. If you do your measurement within 10 days, then you're measuring your own error. So the rule is you have at least two to three weeks between measurements. Otherwise you're measuring your own error. And um, uh, so that's important that you uh, make sure that you have uh, uh, multiple measurements, but at least two, three weeks between them. Uh, and um, routine ultrasound, and, and also be aware that routine ultrasound after 24 week in low risk pregnancy does not improve the perinatal outcome to detect these cases. So there are other indications that why you need to do the measurements of growth, but if you have a perfectly healthy pregnancy and it is developing absolutely normal, then doing a scan to, to uh, determine growth at 30 weeks is not telling you any more. Now, what are the factors important for growth restriction? Actually, if we look at the fetus, there are various origins of these factors. If we look at the fetus, if you are aware that there is a chromosome anomaly, you might be aware of that due to the prenatal screening or due to encountering anomalies. Um, and you might be aware that there is a genetic syndrome or that you have congenital uh, anomalies encounter. Of course, there's a higher risk of fetal growth restriction. The origin might be maternal, idiopathic in some cases, but the mother may have a chronic disease, may have chronic hypertension, or uh, uh, has an antiphospholipid uh, problem, or there is abnormal implantation in the placenta, or she is developing help or a preeclampsia. Pre in those cases, there is a much higher risk of um, fetal growth restriction. There may be external factors, such as smoking, having had an infection and CMV infection, obviously a much higher risk of, of growth restriction. And she may be uh, psychos, there may be psych psychosocial uh, factors like, like she has a low socioeconomic status and, and her living conditions are poor. Then you also know that there is a higher chance of fetal growth restriction and you should care for this mother very, very carefully. And then as a last resort, you may have placenta origins that there may be a mosaicism in the placenta. You weren't aware of that. But if you've done a, a, a coronic venous sample, a venous sample, for instance, for another reason, you may have encountered that and you think, ooh, this might be the cause of fetal growth restriction. The mother may have a uterus anomaly, uh, which you might have encountered due to uh, getting a difficult pregnancy, or 
you may also encounter a velamentous uh, insertion of the placenta. And therefore, it's good if you look at the placenta, where is the cord going into the placenta? Is that the origin of a uh, possible developing growth restriction? And then you have these high risk women where um, there is not a normal development of the utero placental circulation. Uh, these women might develop preeclampsia later on. And it is very interesting that in that case, between eight and 18 weeks of gestation, you have the spiral arteries and the trophoblast of the fetus or of the placenta is actually not going into the myometrium and into uh, one third of this, these vessels and opening them up and making them funnel shaped like they should be like this. And in that case, if you see this type of vessels, well, we won't see those vessels, but we can do the measurement of the Doppler of the uterine artery. And you see this flow and you can hear it. And it is an open circulation towards the placenta and providing enough nutrients and oxygen for the fetus to develop. If that uh, process is not developing normally and you remain in this situation, you remain in this very uh, pulsatile uterine circulation with a notch. And in this case, you know that this, uh, you, can, you only have to do these measurements once between 20 and 24 weeks. You don't have to repeat it and find out if it will develop normal. If it's like that, it's like that. And then you encounter poor placental circulation and much higher risk of developing growth restriction. Now, early growth restriction, less than 32 weeks, actually it's quite easy to diagnose with the uh, growth measurements and the Doppler, but it is very difficult to treat because uh, you want to get the baby as, as far as, as possible and not uh, uh, have to deal with prematurity and growth restriction because that has such great risk for the fetus. Late fetal growth restriction is um, more difficult to diagnose, but easy to treat because the diagnosis is usually after the baby has already uh, attained a gestational age of 32 weeks. Sometimes you find some Doppler abnormalities in the uh, middle cerebral artery, but usually there is not uh, so much um, uh, Doppler uh, abnormalities. Uh, it, it doesn't have to be that case, but you encounter that growth is probably uh, diminishing and uh, you, know, you know that there might be a risk factor, but it is much more easy to treat because you have a lesser risk of this severe prematurity. Uh, and then you, uh, the timing of an early fetal growth restriction when, uh, when to time delivery, yes, well, that is really a, quite a difficult problem because you can see even on ultrasound how the brain is developing between 12, 20 and 30 weeks. You see that the, the brain is quite simple still in 40 weeks. And at 30 weeks, you have some windings, but there is still so much happening to the fetus where all these different, different windings are occurring and um, the brain is developing uh, a lot. And if you have a very early delivery, uh, you will have a much greater risk of neuro disability. On the other hand, if you wait too long, you have a much higher risk of perinatal death. So it is um, important to increase the gestational age as much as possible, but not uh, have a perinatal death uh, occurring. So you have to be very much uh, watching and, and monitoring these uh, fetuses to find the optimal moment uh, for delivery. And it's always usually a discussion between the obstetrician and neonatologist, what is the optimal moment? If you have the luxury that you can discuss this with those two specialities. Um, so in early fetal growth restriction, individualize uh, the management, consider the complications during pregnancy, do the clinical examination and the Doppler uh, umbilical artery and the ductus venosis and the cardiotograph uh, variation is important to uh, consider the moment of delivery. For late fetal growth restriction, consider the pulsatility index in the middle cerebral artery, and you can calculate the cerebral percentile ratio. It should be above one. And 
one of the important things, if you know you're dealing with this type of growth restriction, then don't let the pregnancy get beyond 37, 38 weeks. You will not gain any more uh, important, uh, the, the baby should be able to manage and you will reduce the risk of adverse outcome if you get the baby out around that period. Now, the last subject is, uh, this was all uh, growth restriction, but of obviously uh, you all know that we're also dealing with macrosomia. What is macrosomia? Well, there's a various definitions of macrosomia. And if we uh, choose a birth weight at term, it is more than four and a half kilograms, or it is uh, gestational age dependent above the 97th percentile, then the prevalence is 1.3 to 1.5%. If, if we take the consideration of a birth weight at term of more than 40 kilograms and a gestational age dependence more than 90 centile, then the prevalence is approximately 7% of, uh, of all babies. And um, what are the risk factors of macrosomia? Well, there are obviously known risk factors, maternal diabetes, gestational diabetes, maternal obesity, which we unfortunately encounter more and more often and is certainly not good for the fetus. There may be a family history of macrosomia and obviously there may be genetic syndromes like the beckwith Wiedemann, which you might see when you see a, a, a very large baby with an omphalocele, then you might be dealing with the beckwith Wiedemann and you have other genetic syndromes like Simpson, Golabi, Bemo and Sotos where uh, there is a macrosomia. And um, the, uh, this map is, of an, is a very uh, a map illustrating the number of women aged uh, above 18 and have a BMI above 30 kilograms. How often is that happening? Uh, and that is obviously in North America and in uh, Colombia and, and Chile and Argentina. We encounter a lot of these women and we encounter them also in Russia and uh, North Africa and in South Africa and even also in Oman. So you encounter, and England particularly also, uh, you encounter uh, quite a lot of uh, women with a high BMI and you, that's difficult to scan. It's difficult for your arm, uh, but it's even more difficult for the baby to deal with. What are the risks for the mother in microsomia? Um, well, emergency cesarean section, instrumental delivery, shoulder dystocia, trauma at birth and at the birth canal, and bladder and perinatal and sphincter injuries. So it's quite, you know, it, it's not nothing. And then obviously the fetus also has a risk of uh, uh, greater mortality, brachial plexus injury, facial nerve injury, fracture of the humerus and birth asphyxia. Uh, all those risks are increased. And here is a graph where you can actually uh, see the uh, percentage of, of um, risk uh, uh, of neonatal death uh, according to birth weight, and that is obviously high when the ne uh, when the birth weight is uh, 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 not yet uh, twenty seven hundred grams, but less. Then there is a much higher risk of having a um, uh, if having a, a neonatal death and during when your birth weight is around uh, well 27 to uh, to to approximately 30 uh, 3700 grams then you have the lowest risk possible but again oops sorry about that but it raises again if you uh, become macrosomic due to all these issues that i've just mentioned and um so if we uh, continue, then uh, how are we going to detect uh, macrosomia? Well, assess the risk factors. If you know you're dealing with uh, um, uh, a macro, if you're dealing with risk factors, then you have to look at the baby. And if you, uh, for instance, are uh, if the baby is between 34 and 30. Um, uh, for 32 and 34 weeks, you can do a measurement to establish whether in this uh, women at risk, there is going to be growth uh, macrosomia. And if you see that 
then also try to do a measurement around 38 and 39 weeks. But obviously we know that that will be difficult to do. And it is also difficult in these very um, obese women to, if it is obese women that you're dealing with, to feel the fetus. So it's a difficult estimate to, to, to deal with. Um, and, and we are all aware of that, but it is worthwhile um, to know and, uh, and probably do uh, make sure that you at least do an early delivery and don't make them go beyond 40 weeks. Uh, that certainly shouldn't happen. Monitoring growth in twins. Well, that's the last slide I'm, I'm dealing with. One of the last slides you have uh, uh, in twins, it's in the first place important to know if you're a dichorionic twin or a monochorionic twin. If you're a dichorionic twin from 16 or 20 weeks onwards, the rule is that you measure them every four weeks by ultrasound to see what their growth is every four weeks. And if you have a discrepancy in the measurement of more than 20%, you change your frequency to every two weeks. And if it is monochorionic twins, you start to measure the growth by ultrasound every two weeks from 14 weeks onwards. You do the biometry, you estimate the amniotic fluid, and from 16 weeks onward, you also add Doppler to that because you want to exclude twin-twin transfusions problems, but that's not the subject of this um, lecture. Uh, so for dichorionic or for monochorionic twins, there is a different regime to uh, manage them during pregnancy. So the key points of this lecture were use the BPD, the head circumference, the abdominal circumference, and the femur length actually to estimate fetal weight, leave the BPD out, sorry about that, use only head circumference, abdominal circumference, and femur length, that's your head lock three. Leave at least two weeks between scans, beware of the cause of impaired or increased fetal growth, and assess the growth uh, pattern to monitor the risk if you are dealing with associated anomalies or chromosomes anomalies. Start the onset and frequency of growth assessment in twins, depending on the chorionicity, and also make sure that you estimate the amniotic fluid in both cases, uh, because that tells you a bit about the fetal well being during the scan. And that is the end of this lecture, and I will stop sharing my screen. Thank you very much, Dr. Titia. It was uh, very important and long uh, subjects and lectures and you just accomplished it uh, brilliantly as usual. Thank you so much. I hope I'm within time. <laughs> yes, you are perfectly within time. Thank you so much. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce our next speaker who is uh, Dr. Uh, Badria Nagmushtani Al Sadi. Uh, she's a fetal, uh, she's a maternal fetal medicine specialist. She has been the head of unit of maternal medicine at Royal Hospital since 2016. She has obtained the Arab Board of Health specialization since January 2012. And she has worked in Ottawa General Hospital, University of Ottawa as a maternal fetal medicine clinical and research fellow between 2013 to 2016. She is also in the American Registry for Diagnostic Medical Sonography since 2015. Uh, the topic of her, her talk is assessment of urinary tract, normal and abnormal. So over to you, Dr. Badria. Thank you very much. Uh, hi, everybody. Thank you for your kind uh, introduction. Um, hopefully uh, the attendants still be are awake. So um, if my uh, lecture is uh, appear in the screen, you guys? You cannot see your lecture, Rabadria. Can you share it?
can see it now. No. No, doctor, you have to use the share screen button. Already I used it, uh, but it didn't. I click it. Still. Yes, doctor, now we're able to see your screen. Just uh, run your presentation. Sorry for this. Because, um, technical problems maybe in my uh, laptop. So um, I'm going to talk uh, about the distinguishing between the normal and abnormal appearances of the urinary tract. So our learning objectives for this lecture is number one is to describe how to obtain the two planes required to assess the fetal urinary tract and umbilical arteries correctly. And second objective is to recognize the differences between the normal and most common abnormal ultrasound appearances of the urinary tract. So by the end of the lecture, you will be able to answer these key questions. Number one, what are the key ultrasound features of the plane 13, the kidneys. Number two, what are the key ultrasound features of the plane 14, the bladder? And point number three, what drop movements are required to move from plane 13 to plane 14? And number four, which abnormalities should be excluded after correct assessment of plane 13 and 14? So uh, I think uh, already all of you are familiar with this um, slide. It uh, has been uh, with all of almost the lectures. So as you see, this is like the journey during the scan coming from like head, neck, thorax, to the heart, to the abdomen. And then in my talk, I will reach to the lower abdomen concentrating in vein 13 which is um, the transfer section of left kidney and pelvis, right kidney and pelvis. And in plane 14, uh, which is the transfer section of pelvis, bladder, and both the umbilical arteries. Now, uh, what are the requirements in these planes? So if we will go to plane number 13, it's the transfer section, I said, of left kidney and pelvis, right kidney and pelvis, it uh, evaluates both kidneys with their pelvises, and uh, it measures um, the uh, renal pelvis of both uh, kidneys in the anterior posterior diameter. And if it is more than seven millimeter, it's the reason to refer for a specialist. And what are the abnormalities covered in a plain thirteen? It could become the bilateral renal agenesis, bilateral or unilateral uh, renal pelvic dilatation. And as, as I said, the um, normal is uh, below 7 mm in anterior posterior diameter. And if there is any cystic renal dysplasia, whether it is unilateral or bilateral. And for a plane 14, it's the transverse section of the pelvis, bladder, both the umbilical arteries, uh, evaluate the bladder, umbilical arteries, and genitalia. 
Um, what are the abnormalities can be picked in this plate? We can pick up uh, two vessel cords or any lower urinary tract obstruction. So now moving uh, uh, between the planes, so we move like from uh, plane 12, where the transverse section uh, of abdomen at fourth insertion. So we are moving from like 10, which was the three basal view of the heart, go down to 11, which is the upper abdomen. Sister Titi already she mentioned about the stomach and umbilical veil. And then from 11, you move to 12, where you get the transverse section abdomen at the cord insertion. And from 12, we are sliding also down along the longitudinal uh, part of the fetus. We are coming to the lower abdomen with transverse section of left kidney and pelvis, right kidney and pelvis. After we rotate slightly uh, from that uh, section, from the slide from uh, plane 12. And if you go more down, sliding more down, you will come to the pelvis, to the bladder and both umbilical arteries. So as I said before, it's the longitudinal scan of the spine. And then you will clock rotate, rotate in counterclockwise at the lumbar region. And then gently, so after you longitudinal scan of the spine, you will go to the lumbar region, rotating counterclockwise. And then gentle angle the probe to visualize the kidneys, as it will show here in the video. So here, you get the transverse section of both kidneys, where the vertebra in the center, you can see the three ossification center of the bone, and each kidney on each side of that uh, vertebra. And this is the same demonstration of rotating the probe counterclockwise and angulate slightly, either upward or downward, depending on the orientation. Now, what are the structures usually we are assessing on these planes? So we go to the plane 13. We are assessing the outline of the kidney, which is the capsule. So you will see the tissue of the kidney. The kidney is lying here. After you uh, do some little angulation, you will see one of the kidneys near the spine. We are now you are seeing to that pelvic outline. Then you will go and you will see the pelvis. The area contains some fluid there, the renal pelvis. So you will check whether it is normal or there is any uh, pelvic dilatation. And you can measure it also. But if you want to measure it, it should be in. Uh, transverse plane. So when you measure the pelvis, renal pelvis, it should be in a transverse uh, section where both kidneys, both sides of the spine, you get the anterior posterior diameter from inner to inner. And as I said before, it should be less than seven millimeters, especially from 16 to 27 weeks. If it is more than seven mm, then you need to refer to a special. And here it is demonstrated the same. The measurement is anterior posterior and the meter from inner to inner. Never ever do any pelvic measurement in coronal plane or longitudinal plane. It should be in a transverse section to avoid any overestimate or underestimate of any renal pelvic dilatation. Now, if we move down more, sliding down from plane 12, we are going more down uh, to the lower abdomen, we will reach to the cord insertion to the abdomen and then going that cord to 
para the blood. So here is the plan 14, where you can see the cord insertion to the abdomen. So you can see here the whole abdomen integrity. You see the abdomen, the circumference, all is, is, is complete. There is no defect. There is no infallocele. And also the cord is inserting to the belly and it will go para bladder. Now we'll move to the amniotic fluid, was already mentioned by Dr. Titia, but uh, it is uh, worth it to also mention it in, uh, in case of renal uh, diseases and renal uh, abnormalities. So amniotic fluid is the surrogate indicator of renal function. So if there is a good liquor volume, it means that the kidneys, they are functioning whether they are unilateral or bilateral. So usually the kidney will take over and start functioning uh, from 15 to 16 minutes. So if you see uh, a normal liquor before 15, 16 weeks, it doesn't mean that the kidneys they are functioning. The kidney will take over only after 16 weeks of gestation. And that fluid will help the good movement so that you can see the structure clearly. Now this is, now we are moving to the bladder section. We are moving down in uh, plane 14, where we get the bladder, uh, also integrity. So when you see, this is a, this is the coronal section actually, but usually very few will have a transverse section of the bladder with the cold insertion to the Billy Ankara bladder. But this is a coronal section. It showed this coronal section showing the bladder. This bladder, it is lower down in the abdomen, in the middle. It's the fluid filled, thin wall structure or cystic structure. And here also the stomach which is in the upper abdomen to the left, and here also the diaphragm, and the heart is above the diaphragm. So this is three like cystic structure that you can see. As we explained before, this is where the cord inserted to the abdomen and going to the vara abdomen. And this is confirmed that this is a three-level cord. Now, already we see the a normal uh, renal uh, urinary system for the fetus, kidney, both kidneys. We see the, uh, the bladder, we see the, um, the cord insertion to the abdomen and to the uh, going to the uh, para abs, para bladder. Now, if you know the normal structure, then you will know abnormality in the kidneys or in the bladder. So now, uh, let us move to the, um, the slide in the upper left, where you can see the transverse section here of the kidneys. The spine is here, where we can see the three esophagation center. On the left side, we can see the kidney, the structure of the kidney. And on the left, on the right side, we can see empty fossa, we can see the same structure what we saw in the left side. So then, it's not enough to get only one, one plane. For example, with a transverse section, you have to get it longitudinal section, or if you can also to get it coronal section. So here, for example, the same fetus, here we search, we went and we saw the bladder as we describe it, in the middle, lower of the abdomen, this big structure, thin wall. And if you concentrate also here, you can see the amniotic fluid and it looks normal. So here now we have the picture of 
query missing one kidney with normal bladder, with normal lica. When we go to other plane, we saw that kidney is obvious. We measure it, normal measurement, with normal tissue, and with normal pelvis. So here, it confirmed to you that there is a missing kidney, if there is like any unilateral renal disease. We go more about the scan. Here again, we see a transverse section of the kidneys where we can see both kidneys. So I'm talking about the lower plant. Here again, it's the coronal section where we confirm the same. We can see it is empty foster for both, and we cannot see the uh, kidney tissue. So it could be like probably it is a bilateral renal agency. So after 16 weeks, severe oligohydramnios or anhydramnios. If it is a present, it, uh, it means that it is related to a kidney function. So as I told you before, all the time you have to search for many sections to finalize the your diagnosis. So in, as I explained before, transverse section in this slide, both renal foster was empty. And also in other scans, when they uh, go detailed the scan, we couldn't see the bladder, or if the bladder was persistently also empty. So in that case, um, you have to refer the patient. So when we have severe oligo or anhydramnios or persistent non-visualization of the bladder, even if the amniotic fluid is normal, it should be referred to as special. So the conclusion of the, uh, we have like a diagram here, the dialogue. If you see the bladder and the amniotic fluid is normal, that's good. If you see the bladder, but amniotic fluid is oligo or anhydramnios, we should refer. If you see the bladder, the amniotic fluid is normal, still you refer the patient. And if you see the bladder and amniotic fluid is oligo or anhydramnios, definitely you refer the patient. So the presence of a bladder and normal amniotic fluid is indicated of one or both functioning kidneys. Now we will go to another abnormality, which is the hydronephrosis. As you can see here in the section of the kidney, you can see here, um, when you measure it, there is like increase in the pelvic dilatation. And that increase in pelvic dilatation, not only in the center of the pelvis, it's also including the peripheral, the calyces. So this indicates that this type of hydronephrosis is very severe. So in case of renal pelvis exceeding seven millimeters, either unilateral or bilateral uh, should be referred to a specialized uh, center. And as I said, severe hydronephrosis uh, could be like measurement of more than 15 mm in anterior posterior diameter. And uh, it could be because also of involvement, not only in the central, it also involves the peripheral calicate by the patient. So in this case, you need to refer the patient or the, uh, the mother so that that could be followed with serial growth scan to check whether this dilatation is static, is it progressive, or it is resolving the gestation to increase gestation. Now we are moving to another uh, cystic renal abnormality. So this is, as you can see here, uh, Dr. Batria, if you just raise your voice because it's not clear for the candidates. Yeah, actually, I uh, have a sore throat. I'm trying my best to push my, my talk. Oh, sorry. Sorry for inconvenience, but I'm trying hardly. So in this uh, image, it is a transverse uh, section of the kidney where you can see the multi multiple cystic spaces in varying size. 
non communicating with each other. And the kidney architecture also looks white, like ecogenic. And in this view, this is the coronal section where you can see both kidneys with the same multicystic spaces and then communicating with each other. And the tissue of the kidney is ecogenic. So um, with, with an absence of uh, lica of anhydramine, yes, uh, it confirms the uh, bilateral non functioning kidney. Uh, here also, this is transverse section of kidneys, where you can see one kidney looks normal, and the other kidney on the left side with multi multi cystic multiple cysts, non communicating also. And it looks also uh, ecogenic. So this is right normal kidney with multicystic dysplastic left kidney. Here they could see the bladder, and bladder looks normal, and the fluid also looks normal. So it's like a diagnosis of unilateral uh, multicystic dysplastic kidney. So in general, like single functioning kidney, bladder and amniotic fluid volume is normal. Could be like a differential diagnosis in case of uh, unilateral, could be like a uh, uh, urethral reflex. You cannot exclude it. And uh, <coughs> sorry for that. Huh? So uh, differential diagnosis could be uh, hydronephrosis. The dicoretric process cannot be excluded. Now, moving to another uh, abnormality in the urinary system. It's like uh, a polycystic kidney disease. As you can see in the view, the transverse section of both kidneys, where you can see the spine here, the vertebra, and both kidneys, they are huge. Enlarged and also they look like ecogenic. So you can say here the same. Usually, this is usually enlarged kidneys and it looks also whitish ecogenic. Of course, you get to get the, uh, more from the patient and uh, to rule out what is the of polycystic kidney disease. And of course, you will refer the patient. To a specialist. When we come to the hydronephrosis, we mentioned about unilateral hydronephrosis. This is a bilateral hydronephrosis where you can see severe hydronephrosis in both kidneys involving the central and the peripheral palisades of both kidneys. And here also the same. You can see the right kidney being normal, and the left side or the other kidney looks severely uh, pelvis dilatation. And so, this is the same diagnosis of severe hydronephrosis to be referred to as such. This is also the same. Hydronephrosis, this is like uh, as I said, when you measure it, it should be from inner to inner in a transverse section. And here, when you measure it, it looks in the normal range. And here, both kidneys, both renal pelvis dilated. The right one is the borderline, like the 7 millimeter, and the other one is 16 millimeter. You can get the bilateral hydrogen process and this is both bilateral dilatation of the kidney. When we go to the bladder abnormality, 
So you can see in this picture. There is hydronecrosis bilaterally. It is the coronal section. You can see bilateral dilatation of both kidneys. The other is still present, which highlights a possibility of upper urinary tract obstruction. So you can see the bladder clear. The other image on the right, uh, right side, you can see the bladder. We mentioned before it is thin wall, but in this picture it's a very thick wall. Bladder is heavily distended, and also there is like a look like a keyhole appearance, which highlights the lower urinary tract dilatation below. The bladder is probably it's like for some time it is posterior bladder. Again, so the same, usually very large distended bladder, the thick wall, and there was no fluid and hydramia with keyhole appearance also. So, highlight the same bladder outlet obstruction is most likely cerebral. So, this is some of the examples of abnormalities in the urinary tract system. Here also. As we mentioned before, when we go to the section of uh, cord insertion to the abdomen, we just put a Doppler image, and then we can see here it's only a single umbilical artery rather than two terminal umbilical arteries. So, this is the diagnosis of single umbilical artery, which can be in the normal fetuses, but sometimes could associate with. Any other anomaly or chromosomal anomaly, so it's worth it to refer to a session. I'm coming to my end of my presentation. So the key points we covered: fetal kidneys should be assessed in transverse, safe, not enough only one plane to get more information. Second point: identification of the kidneys. Is by means of renal capsule and fluid in the renal pelvis so that you're not confused with other structure like bowel, for example. The third point renal pelvis diameter should be measured in anterior posterior diameter in transverse section. And if it is more than 7 mm, uh, you need to refer to specialist. And you notice know, fluid volume is an important determinant of renal function. And use of color Doppler over area of cord insertion into the abdomen and parabladder help identify the umbilical artery. This is my end of my presentation. Thank you for your listening and attending. And thank you very much, Dr. Vadria. Uh, it was a, a fantastic talk. All right, I think we have some time left to answer some questions if that's okay. Okay, so let's go. All right. So I first go ahead with uh, the questions in question and answer box. So there is a question about, um, is it possible to diagnose uh, diaphragmatic hernia at booking a scan at 10 weeks. All right, so I think all of the speakers are agree that it's not possible. So uh, simple, no, you have to wait. <laughs> okay, and Dr. Musa, this is a question for you. What graph for fetal growth is used in Oman? Uh... As Dr. Titia already mentioned, we are still not using the one graph. I mean, it depends on the um, uh, institution you are working uh, in. Um, we are planning with the Women and Child Health Department to uh, make one graph for the whole, I mean, national, uh, depending on, but that it will take time, I mean, not like within a year or two years. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, and another question about uh, new call fold thickness can be interpreted. The new call fold measurement is suspecting Down syndrome. Uh, I, I would like just to ask all of the speakers to contribute. So maybe Dr. Mega, are you happy to answer? Uh, you, are, you have to unmute yourself, I think. Yeah, okay. So the nuchal fold thickness, how does it help in downs? Yes. Is that the question? Yes, yeah, okay. that's the question. So, um, well, an increased nuchal indicates a lot of things apart from Downs. There could be any other anomaly in the baby. There could be a cardiac anomaly. And there is no way on scan you can say that the baby has Downs. The only way is by either doing an invasive procedure or a non-invasive prenatal testing. On scan, no, there is no way you can say a baby has Downs. Yeah, that's true. But in general, I think it's worthwhile just to denote that if it, if it comes like an isolated finding, it's not considered to be a, a structural abnormality, but it is considered to be a soft marker, which actually increases the calculated risk of Down syndrome by 10 times. So it needs proper workup and we need to look at, to have a better look at chromosomal abnormalities. Again, I emphasize as an isolated marker, it's worthwhile to at least ask for a cell-free DNA test and also to have a better look at the heart to exclude congenital heart disease and sometimes to ask for torture studies. I don't know if Dr. Titia, you have anything to add or Dr. Musa. I agree, I think uh, uh, you have covered the, uh, the, the different yes. possibilities of increased knuckle fold thickness. So I also agree with you. You cover the subject. Yes. Thank you. Okay. So yeah. Uh, another question about fetal growth restriction. Why late growth restriction is difficult to diagnose? So that's the Titia. Well, one of the reasons it may be difficult to diagnose is because you're not aware that it is occurring. And um, on the other hand, we, we have plenty of studies showing that if in a low risk population, you're going to uh, um, do a routine, one routine scan uh, at, at 30 weeks to estimate growth, it will not tell you anything. I mean, we, we know that it is not any better in picking up growth restriction uh, than having a clinical judgment. And I think uh, therefore, in late pregnancy, if, if the baby is at the late time uh, showing that it's probably going to um, have less of his potential of growth, that may be difficult to pick up. Uh, and but on the other hand, if there are any clinical signals, be, um, be uh, vigilant for them and react to them and, and, and then indeed do another investigation. If the mother shows any form of hypertension, go also and look for the growth of the baby. And I don't know, maybe Dr. Musa uh, has more uh, to add to that. And you? Uh, actually, you have covered most of the volume, Dr. Musa. Uh, <laughs> the issue here, as you have said, yeah, we are not, uh, I mean, studies have shown that in low-risk pregnancy, we cannot, I mean, review the scan every four weeks just to pick up uh, one case. So yes, with uh, gestation growth restriction, very difficult to diagnose. And uh, um, the, 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 the main concern is about the early onset growth restriction. That is the one which is associated with more morbidity and mortality. Indeed, yes. Thank you. Um, another question, how to measure ductus venosus? Ah, now, I don't think this is part of basic training course, but um, if you want, it's, it's a challenge. If you want to measure the um, uh, ductus venosus, actually, you take a cross section of the tummy, you look where the, and you put a, a small box of color, uh, because the ductus venosus comes from the umbilical vein and then goes uh, in the ductus venosus towards the uh, fetal heart. So, uh, 
where you see the ductus venosus going near the portal vein, there actually you put a box of color and you see it light up actually bright red, yellowish or bright blue, uh, greenish, because the flow in the ductus venosus is very rapid. And at, so you pick it up really by color where it is because it's a tiny, tiny vessel. And that's where you put your pulse doppler and that's how you get it. And you can get it in a cross section and you can also get it in a longitudinal section. But it indeed is, is something you need to do in these infants with uh, no, these fetuses, which are extremely growth restricted. So hopefully the mother is at that point already admitted before you start doing ductus venosus scans. Thank you. Uh, another question about dichorionic diamniotic twin pregnancy. Do this kind of pregnancy need Doppler in each scan? No. If, uh, no, particularly if you follow up growth every four weeks and the baby, uh, the babies, uh, the, fe the fetuses, they follow their graph and they, they show normal growth, then you don't have to do Doppler. The moment you see one going off its own line, of course, then you can add doing Doppler. And, uh, but, but otherwise, um, you don't have to do it if they show normal growth and if there's no, not any reason to suspect. And I don't know if Dr. Musa, do you do the same thing in Oman or do you do something different? No, actually, I agree with you. Uh, we don't do Doppler unless there is growth of so. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So the next question, like constitutionally small babies, do we use the term constitutionally large babies for fetuses with larger parameters for the gestational age for large parents? We don't have population-based charts. No. <laughs> this is a good question, actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Yes, but then, uh, no, we don't have those graphs. And actually, um, we may not be sure that a constitutionally, if you would call it like that, large baby will not suffer from the birth problems of another uh, macrosomic baby, uh, whether the parents are large or not. Now, it's not that I do a lot of deliveries at the moment, but I, um, I wouldn't think... Uh, that um, to separate them out like that and that saying that they wouldn't have a risk for birth trauma is correct. So I would still uh, be vigilant for them. Thank you. Uh, luckily, I see, uh, I see agreements uh, among the team. Thank you very much. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Um, so the next question is for uh, Dr. Badria. Um, is there a difference of dilation of renal pelvises according to the gestational age? Yes, there is actually. You can hear me, guys? Yes. Yes, we can. Yeah. So, yeah, usually um, we have to see whether the gestational age is below 28 weeks or above 28, 28 weeks. So, cut off point, if it is below 28 weeks, I will be even cautious if I saw four or five millimeters. But if she is more than 28 weeks, up to seven millimeters is fine. With time, with gestational age advance, we are expecting to, to be a little bit of dilatation up to seven. But as early as gestation, for example, 20 or 20, 22 weeks to C7, it is more um, like you have to be very, close, very careful. So there is, yes, there is. There is difference between the gestational age. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, and actually, there is a so so in general, I think um, we, in for not only about the dilation, but the the measurement itself. I mean, the size of the renal pelvis changes according to gestational age. Yes. So, like other measurements of the baby, they have their own uh, cutoffs and their own graphs. Yes. Uh, and another question about the kidneys, Dr. Badria, what are the normal measurements of kidneys? Well, also, yeah, you are not expecting um, kidney measurement with, I'm talking about not very early gestation, but like, let us say, um, mid third trimester, for example, you're not expecting the, uh, 
if it needs to be more than three uh, centimeters. So it's like two to two point five centimeters is the normal measurement of the kidney. There is also special measurement for the kidney. So it exceeds three to be like enlarged to be. Okay, so you agree that there, there are again graphs yes. for normal measurements of the kidneys. Yes. Thank you. Uh, during the gestation and those graphs are available. Yeah. So the next question, how to take abdominal circumference measurement if the abdomen is not completely round or is compressed by lower limbs? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, uh, sometimes you indeed see that the, the knee is sort of, or, or the upper leg is pressing within the abdomen and, and you have sort of, yes, a dent. Uh, then, then it might be difficult, or if there's oligohydramnios, then it is also difficult to get a proper measurement. Um, on your ultrasound machine, the, the, the thing that I do is that actually you don't use the ellipse then. You might do the, the A, the transabdominal and the um, anterior posterior measurement times 1.57, or the thing that I do is on my ultrasound machine, and actually every ultra machine, ultrasound machine has it, but you probably haven't found that knob. You can actually measure the whole abdominal circumference by encircling it by point. And this is what I do. I would encircle it by point and then you know, include the dent because of that, that's there. And then usually I get, uh, it's my experience that my measurements have been, um, Okay, if particularly also if we have to look at at a delivery in the in the near time, um, so this is what I do. Uh, so don't use the ellipse, but you there is a knob that you can use um, uh, measure by point, and that's what I would do. Uh, would you also um, uh, advise to do this? Um, th there is a there's also a possibility of. Uh, um, following the circumference like yes. Yeah, well, that's, yes, exactly. I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah okay. You, you follow the, you, you, that's what I mean. You follow the circumference mm -hmm. by different points. And, but if I follow yeah. the circumference in, in one line, I always go wrong. I mean, you know, I have one thing. So that, that's why I take points just to make uh, uh, myself more clear. But I mean, there's, as long as you can follow the circumference and you don't do yeah. it by an ellipse, yeah, I think the name of the application is um, circumference trace on my... Yeah, something like that, yes. Yeah, something yes. like that. Or trace by points or something like that. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> so there's, there's a question in the chat box, again to Dr. Badria. Any cutoff for renal pelvis's diameter that necessitates induction of labor after 37 weeks? It is a controversial. controversial. There is no like special cut of a number to say whether to deliver a sheet already 37 weeks or to keep it. It is a controversial. There is no specific time for measurement. And and still, I think it's it's something subject to multidisciplinary team decision, isn't it? Yes. Um, because yes. it's not something that obstetrician or the sonographer or the fetal medicine specialist can decide yeah. by her or his own. No, I fully agree. Yes, yeah. Yes. I don't, think to... cut, uh, hmm? I don't think there's a cut measurement uh, to decide about induction of labor. Anyway, the placenta itself is uh, uh, protecting the baby from any uh, uh, renal compromise. So even if it is, for example, 30 millimeter uh, induction of labor, it will not improve the prognosis or uh, change the prognosis. Uh, the fetus already, I mean, the placenta is for the fetus like um, uh, kidney, another kidney. So um, induction of labor, unless it is there is another uh, risk factors, it will not change the, the prognosis. So no renal anomaly is an indication for an early delivery. You just let the baby deliver whenever the baby wants to. Yeah. 
Uh, another question about the kidneys, how we can visualize both kidneys in transverse plane if we suspect polycystic kidney disease? In the same way you are visualizing the normal kidney. If you go, as I explain it in the presentation, you are sliding down from up to the whole the spine. Then if you rotate, you see both kidneys and then you dip like angulate a little bit, you can see like both kidneys in each side. You get you get the transverse section, you get the lentibular section, you get the coronal section, all these sections. It gets it gives you some hint whether it is polycystic or it is enlarged. So you don't have any other sections apart from these three sections: transverse, vegetal, and coronal. Can view all the kidneys. Whether it is multicystic, whether it is enlarged, whether it is a hydronephrosis, you have to search and manipulate in these planes to see to get the diagnosis. I don't know if I'm answering the question or. She meant something yeah. else. I think that clarifies the situation. Yeah. yeah, we need to look at any any abnormality, any suspected abnormality at all three planes. And another question, can adrenals be mistaken for kidneys? Depends on the operator also and the expertise. I mean, uh, the location of the kidneys, the architecture of the kidneys is a little bit different from suprarenal, but more you get used to the scan, more you will be more, um, and more um, expert in picking up the, uh, and differentiate between renal or suprarenal. Yeah, actually, I think they are much different. I, I, yeah. I, I don't think that there, there, are, there are really that much similarities that we might yeah. mix them up because in terms of echogenicity, they are different. Kidneys are more echogenic. Normal or abnormal, both are more echogenic than adrenals. The size is much different. The, yeah. If you look at the renal arteries, yeah. they are quite different. They have two renal pelvises, again, adrenals are lacking any pelvis-like structure. So I personally think it's, yeah, they don't have that much similarities yeah. to be mixed yeah. up. I would agree. Agree. Okay, I think I am, I guess I have covered all the questions. I hope I haven't missed anything. If I've missed anything, please. Let me know. Uh, there's, a, there's a question to Dr. Titia. Many yeah. times midwives call us to estimate fetal weight in tropartum yeah. for suspected macrosomia, um, making some dilemma. Any suggestions? <laughs> Educate your midwives. <laughs> That is not the time to decide on macrosomia. I mean, obviously, if, if somebody walks in and has never had a, a, a scan, then, then yes, I can imagine that you might be surprised. But I mean, this is not the time to estimate fetal weight. And, and, and so that cannot be every time. So if this happens more often, I think you should ex give them a lecture, the midwives, on how to deal with ultrasound and estimating fetal weight. And that, um, uh, that should, you know, that the, the measurement should be done or, or the estimation should be done way before delivery. Um, this is, I mean, I, do, doing a measurement like that during delivery is not really very helpful. You should have picked up that there is a problem long before. And, and I, I presume they, there is regular uh, checkups of, of um, pregnancies in, in the last uh, period of pregnancy. So I would imagine 
that at that stage, somebody should have picked up that there might be a difficulty with growth, either growth restriction or macrozonia. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, true. Dr. Musa, what, what you know best? No, actually, I agree with you, Dr. Titi. I mean, you, you have already mentioned in your, in your uh, talk that after 37 weeks, the clinical estimation is almost uh, even superior uh, to the scan yeah. because yeah. they had already engaged, and even if you uh, they had already down in the pelvis, you will not get the accurate measurement. No. And if you're suspecting macrosomia clinically, then you have to take all the precautions to avoid any uh, morbidity or trauma, whether to the mother or to the baby. The scan will not add any more things. Uh, the clinical estimation will be much better in this uh, scenario. Yeah. yeah, well, good we, good we agree. <laughs> <laughs> now the middle of the will kill us. <laughs> yeah, true. Uh, there's a question to me by Dr. Juha. Hello, Dr. Juha. Uh, it's important. Is it important to enter the LMP in the beginning of doing the viability scan, as not all machines has the features, especially the old ones? Is there any difference in the measurement if LMP is entered? Uh, actually, um, I, me personally, um, I use a database, so I enter the LMP and the CRL all the measurements in my database. It's a computer-based software, so it calculates many things. Um, I'm about if you do it on your machine. Obviously, you need to look at the settings. You, you need to choose the charts also just to match the to, to map the CRL against the gestational age and all the things that we do very easily on our softwares as a database, you have to do them on the machine. Um, if you have the, I, I mean, it's up to you. If you are using the software, the database, do it on, on that. If you are using your machine, you have to do it there. Um, I'm not aware if somebody is doing everything manually. Uh, I think you need to do, because that's quite difficult to, to keep the records manually. Uh, I don't know if Dr. Musa has to add anything, because I, I am not really aware of any machine that doesn't have any place to enter date. No, I agree with you, Dr. Titia. I mean, all, all the machines have... Uh... I mean, uh, when you go to the patient information, you have to write the patient name, the ID number, and in the obstetric side, you have to uh, write the last menstrual period, and that will calculate automatically the gestational age. If you don't have that facility, there is also in the patient information system, in the antenatal, in the pregnancy details, you have also to enter the last menstrual period, and that will calculate automatically the gestational age. So whether it is on the scan or if you don't have the scan facility, which is unlikely, then you can use the patient information system. Here in Oman, we have good patient information uh, system, which is a Shifa. And there is part which is related to the pregnancy detail, where you can put the last menstrual period and to calculate automatically the gestational age and the expected date of delivery if there is no discrepancy between the scan and the uh, the expected date by the scan or by the last menstrual period. Unless you have, you don't have the obstetric setting. Maybe that's that's the reason. Obstetric setting, you mean in the scan machine? Yeah, in the scan, maybe it has not been chosen. If if you choose some other setting, apart from obstetrics, for example, you you know there are some settings for adults mm -hmm. or for pediatrics. Perhaps they don't have the place to enter last menstrual period. Maybe that's the reason. Uh, to my understanding, most of the local health center, I mean, and body clinics, which see obstetric patients, they have scanned facilities uh, which where, where there is obstetric software. Um, I understand. I, I mean, maybe the setting yes, has, has been wrongly. Yeah. 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 Um, set like some non obstetric thing. Yeah, if they have this issue, what they can do, they can ask the technician to come and yeah. adjust the setup of the scan um, according to their uh, requirement. Okay, so I think that will conclude the questions. Thank you very much. The audience expressed their appreciation to all the speakers, and I hope I haven't missed anything. I think you did. Okay. okay.
Thank you yeah, so much. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very Bye. Much. Bye bye. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you to all the candidates who stayed here yeah. now. Uh, it's today's uh, weekend, and uh, mashallah, they are still uh, with us till uh, <laughs> end of the day. So I would like to thank all of you. Special thank to all the speakers, and we will meet next week, uh, Wednesday, Thursday. It will be the last two days of the workshop, and um, at the end of the four days workshop, uh, we will send you the post assessment test. So please do it to get the certificate. And I hope you already did the pre-assessment uh, test, uh, which also have been sent to you when we have sent uh, the, loom, uh, the Zoom link. So all the best and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good night. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye, everyone.